1885. It was not called that then. Uh, but Hume was, of course, a civil servant, and he lived in Shimla. He was posted to Shimla, uh, and uh, his home still exists, uh, Rothney Castle. I'm going to talk about Hume for just a moment. Hume was the collector of Itawa when the Great Revolt of 57 broke out. And he helped to suppress it, of course, but then he also mitigated the revenge that the East India Company took on the rebels. His record in Madhya Pradesh, where he was Etava, these are areas, uh, border of uh, you, what is currently UP and Madhya Pradesh. Jhansi, Jhansi is in Uttar Pradesh. So that is the area that he was posted in. And his accounts of those times are of extraordinary importance. And Hume has been completely forgotten, both by Western and Indian scholarship. The only ones who tried to do something was a former fellow of uh, the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, Professor S.R. Malhotra, who was a PhD from London. He came back to India. And in his last days, he tried to, uh, you know, along with another professor uh, in, in, I think, Canada, they tried to put together the selected works of Hume. And only one volume, unfortunately, only one volume was published. I think Professor Malhotra passed away. And the first volume is not of that much interest to us because it's all the colonial records of that time and his contributions to the administration. But uh, the thing about Indology and Hume's contribution to Indology is not just that he founded the Congress, not just that he helped uh, Indians who wanted to struggle uh, for more powers throughout his life, even after come, going back to London, but uh, he was a theosophist for a brief while. So Madame Blavatsky came to Shimla and materialized objects, which was later, in a sense, uh, denounced by Hume himself. He stopped being a theosophist after a while. But it was a very important moment of India's reappraisal. Annie Besant was a theosophist. And the reconstruction of uh, Indian civilization, even of Buddhism, in all of this theosophy played a huge role. Dharmapala, who was a great uh, reviver of Buddhism in Sri Lanka, he was helped by the Theosophical Society tremendously. They set up a, a unit in Sri Lanka. So, and of course, uh, uh, Swami Vivekananda's visit to the Parliament of Religions. Now, all of that is deeply interconnected. I don't think Vivekananda came to Shimla, though. Now, Hume was the greatest ornithologist. He studied birds that British India had produced. He was called the Pope of Ornithology. So whatever we know about Indian birds today, Salim Ali and all, they came in the wake of Hume. And right here in Shimla, his home had been turned into a museum. He had collected bird species and eggs from all over India. Later, he stopped killing birds to stuff them because he became vegetarian. But Hume was an extraordinary person, and this entire collection was then donated to the British Museum, which was one unit then, now it's the British Museum of Natural History, it's a separate museum now. But you can go there today and see that the maximum single donation of specimens in that museum, the largest single uh, donation has come from Alan Octavian Hume. Later, he became uh, somebody who, who studied the flora and fauna of India, and his whole house was like a greenhouse in a museum. So, Indology is also the understanding of, uh, if you read Kalidasa, it's full of descriptions of Indian birds, uh, flora, fauna, plants, the Megadutam. So, Indology is also all of this, and we can't forget uh, all the Westerners who helped understand. Now, the vast uh, continent, subcontinent, that was India. So on that note, I think I should turn it over to, to my friend, my colleague, going back to Hyderabad Times, uh, Sunaina Singh, and uh, welcome her and welcome all of you once again to our deliberations. I request you right at the outset to send us your papers. Uh, we do want to publish a volume, if possible. So let us move from a reactive 
uh, endology to an enabling endology. And I think the critique of Western representations of Western endology should continue, obviously. Uh, and uh, that's not a task to be abandoned, but the reactive uh, and uh, sometimes I might even call it fanatical, uh, uh, you might say attempts to degrade or denounce all of Western understanding of India uh, are, are pointless. Uh, I might just end on one last thing. I'm reminded of Bala Gangadhar, who asked the question, what do we learn from Western Indology? What does Western Indology teach us about India? And he says, we think it's a window, but it's a two-way mirror. It actually only shows you uh, the West's own face. I disagree with Bala Gangadhar. It is both a window and a mirror. So when you read when you read uh, Mill on India, it does tell you about Mill. It does tell you about the utilitarians. It does tell you about the liberals, the Whigs, uh, who who wanted to take over, uh, you know, India. British paramountcy was just happening, and like the cons uh, on the, the conservative, uh, the Burks and the Pitts. It does tell you about them. And so when Hegel writes about India, it does tell you about Hegel. It does tell you about Europe perhaps more than it tells you about India. But a hundred other scholars, when they write about India, it also tells you about India. Uh, and that knowledge is, is worthwhile. Thank you so much. I'm going to mute and uh, turn it over to, to Sunaina Ji. Go ahead. Well, Namaskar, good morning. I must begin by congratulating uh, Professor Makarand Karanjpe for that very lucid uh, portrayal of how we have moved from Indology to Indic studies in a sense, I would say. Uh, and also congratulate uh, Pankaj Jayanji for uh, organizing this conference, workshop on Indic studies and the new directions in Indic studies. Uh, well, before I begin, I must, on a personal note, uh, since Makarand has uh, given such a, you know, a good introduction of most of us here, uh, we go back a long way and, and, uh, in Hyderabad and ASRC and our research as students of literature, where there were no silos between philosophy, sociology, psychology, and we had lengthy discussions on how literature must evolve in India, particularly keeping the Indic perspective in mind. So um, and thank you, Makaran, for those kind words at the beginning. Uh, well, I cannot but help uh, begin with a, a prayer for, uh, for the ailing pandemic patients. You know, during these raging pandemic times, you know, these are desperate and bleak times. And uh, I, I think it's very important for us to be optimistic uh, in these days and also hold on to our resilience, which is part of the Indian ethos. Uh, it's part of the Indian reflective tradition and wisdom. I think that that's the only way to uh, keep above the raging pandemic and raise the bar where, wherever we can in terms of our strength and resilience. Uh, so let's pray for everyone and hope that India is in a better place very soon. Uh, so is the world. Uh, with those words, I must uh, now begin. Makrand is back. Makrand, I'm just thanking you uh, for those kind words. We missed you for a no, minute. No, no, I'm very much here. I'm very much here. I'm very much here. Yeah, Go okay. ahead. So um, I, I must, uh, you know, I sat here at Rajki, uh, uh, which was Rajgriha and the capital of Mauryan Empire. Uh, this is the seat of knowledge, as they say, in Nalanda. Uh, 8,000 uh, you know, eight centuries after the destruction of uh, Nalanda University, an attempt was made to reinvent, recreate, re-establish Nalanda. And I'm privileged and honored to be here 
and take another look at how do we uh, rebuild Nalanda because um, I generally say that there must be a course on learning from the roots, you know, uh, because uh, Dinkar Ji had put it so beautifully, Ramdhari Dinkar, and he had said, and I quote him, Ya khandhar unka jiska jab kabhi das aur shishita, ya khandhar unka jinse bharat unka itihas banata. I think that is where. I, I would pause it and look at Indic civilization because I think Nalanda and Takshashila were completely immersed in um, teaching the Indian civilization, in, in expostulating, in, in trying to reflect on the reflective tradition of India. So that is where the Indic uh, civilization came alive in both Takshashila and Nalanda. And the different streams of thought. The, we know that Indian civilization by far is the longest surviving civilization on the planet. You know, and also that how is the Indic civilization different from other civilizations? Because I was looking at uh, Rudolf has, uh, you know, the introduction that has been given and we've been hearing and uh, reading Rudolf. You know, who's talking about how the binaries uh, were created uh, by the West or the Europe about India, and these binaries need to be defeated. So I think uh, uh, this conference on Indian studies and uh, the new directions to Indology uh, beyond imperialism of categories, I think, well placed and at the right time. Because we do need to reimagine and reinvent. You know, it's also a way of looking at how do we redefine ourselves? Uh, do we go back to our reflective tradition and uh, uh, look at what it had to tell us? What is it that has uh, continued to keep its relevance alive after all these years? I mean, 5,000 uh, years, and you know, you. You have five more than five millennia, and uh, it continues to survive. It continues to engage our minds. It continues to interest the world. Still looks at us. Uh, Indology and Indic studies is quite popular in the West and Europe. Almost all universities seem to have a course in this. But how do they draft their course depends on the kind of Indology that they have been defining and the way they have been defining India. You know, for me, it's, 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 it's a culture that's been vibrant, diverse and pluralistic in its heritage, uh, in its thinking, in its religious postulations. You know, um, it's, it's been an ocean of wisdom uh, given the diverse uh, strains in Indian ethos because when you look at the Indic civilization uh, over the years, you know, how do we define this knowledge tradition? Because I look at Indic civilization or heritage as primarily as knowledge system. It's an Indian knowledge heritage to my mind. Because uh, we need to distinguish between Abrahamic system and uh, the Vedic knowledge system. Uh, Abrahamic, as we all know, is theocentric, has been theocentric and continues perhaps to be theocentric. Whereas the Vedic knowledge system has within its fold the Sanatan Dharma, the Baut, the Jain, and the Sikhism. You know, uh, these informers, these elevators, they come together, they create a knowledge pool that needs to be. Uh, looked into from the 21st uh, century perspective. Uh, I firmly believe an institution like Nalanda or any other institution for that matter must learn to pool the wisdom of the Indic civilization, the kind of literature that we have had. We had an unbroken tradition of uh, knowledge system, the oldest extant spiritual literature 
to my mind. And you know, it, it contains, the Vedas contain beautiful hymns in Sanskrit addressed to various um, gods. And that is where uh, I look at, uh, if I look at, uh, you know, our own traditional uh, Ved, you, you have so much to learn. The relevance of Atharv Ved today, particularly given the Bhumi Sut, uh, from Atharv Ved has 63 uh, Sut on, on nature, you know, the relevance, how it continues to be relevant in today's terms, it's startling in the contemporary le relevance, you know, to the ecological crisis that humanity faces today the global warming and things that have been happening to the world past decades is, is resonant of what is being said in other way. So I think it's time that we go back to our uh, uh, Vedas and Upanishads. We go back to the uh, Baud and the Jain philosophy of thought. So uh, coming back to uh, the Vedic knowledge system, um, let me, before I pass it on some of the issues, um, I, I must uh, I must state here that I'm not a Sanskritist. However, I am uh, a student of uh, Vedic systems, a, a cultural ethos. Uh, so today, uh, a few ideas that I share with you are, uh, you know, these are the insights that I have accumulated over a period of time about our own culture. You know, how do we look at our own Indian ethos? How do we look at our proliferating literature right from the beginning of the Vedic period? So uh, how, how do we define our heritage? And I thought the only way to define it is through the knowledge tradition, because all that we have in our system is the knowledge and the knowledge tradition uh, Bhagavad Gita uh, Krishna somewhere say, tells Arjuna that uh, knowledge is about Lok Sangra, you know, coming together how for the welfare of man. Our knowledge systems, you know, uh, they point to the relevance of how uh, the welfare of man is the prime objective. Now, that being the objective, we also need to understand that uh, the Vedic knowledge system also, you know, throws at us a, a few ideas which might be very different from Abrahamic system. And that is the cafeteria approach to God. That's another uh, thing that uh, Indic civilization uh, tells us because there are 33 categories of uh, force of nature and the god, the, the polytheistic representation is that each uh, energy force is depicted by a god. And so we learn from nature. We, we are grounded here in many, many ways. And we look at how uh, that itself was developed through Upanishads, which is, I, th I think, uh, the I think the most uh, qualified uh, text, if I may say that, about uh, Upanishad, where the, it is about the discussions between the student and teacher. I say that because most of us come from the academic field, and it's important to recognize that discussions and debates, the Tarkshast, Bharatrihari has written a lot about Tark and Kutark in his Shastra. So very important that we understand where we come from and how we need to reimagine this in different ways. Um, so the point that I'm trying to make is that in India, we have moved in different directions. And we have moved from Upanishadic Vedic tradition to Baud Dharma. Now, the seminal contribution of Buddh, to my mind, is, uh, is the shift from ritual to reason. How he took religion to the masses uh, through reason. I think this is very important 
it's also very important that when we talk about tarp, we are, we are uh, actually talking about uh, Anekal's work, you know, uh, the Jain philosophy, where there is pluralism all through, and that, that also defines Indic civilization and culture. Uh, the existence of multiple truths, and not just one, is the ethos of pluralism. And I think that has been uh, indicated by many of the ontological uh, studies on Indic civilization. It's also important to remind ourselves that uh, the Indic civilization has contributed to the world. Uh, it's, it's a rich, vibrant, wise heritage uh, coming through long corridors of history. And uh, this is where truth also becomes very relevant because it is dialogic, it is uh, pluralistic, and, and that is where I think uh, uh, our Bhagavad Puran speaks about how the knowledge tradition is based on duty and responsibility. You know, that is the truth of uh, Purushat, because man is defined as a, a being who is situated in his Purusha, through his domain of Purusha. I think this is a very important thing because man's relationship with God is through Dharma, through his duties. So this uh, uh, plays a very important role in how we look at Indic studies today because uh, it, it represents truth in many forms, in many narratives. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's important to look at uh, the Bhuti Yoga chapter 10 of Bhagavad Gita again, which beautifully describes the divine presence, that how truth manifests in multiple ways. So the learnings from the Indic uh, ethos per se has, is diverse, is pluralistic. How do we reimagine Indic studies and Indic ethos in our academic curricula. I think that's how I would like to look at this conference. How do we redefine it in our institutional mechanism is to present the collective wisdom of uh, Indic ethos in its diverse forms. How do we pool these ideas? I think it's very important that in India, the the civilization, the learning, the knowledge tradition was not utilitarian in its concept. You know, books were read, philosophies were read <laughs> to, <laughs> to understand them, uh, not to be used in a context or to be used for a purpose. You know, that, that that's the difference because here we are looking at how India's uh, cultural heritage is multi-stranded and uh, humongous in its diversity in different and how do we learn from it how do we project it to the 21st century or how do we project it to our youngsters this uh, dialogic tapestry of knowledge wisdom and insights um, and its traditions need to be put very coherently need to be presented i think it's important that we look at uh, uh, texts like Bhagavad Gita, the, the principles of our uh, Vedic tradition, uh, we look at our Upanishads, we look at our uh, mythology, uh, these have played a very important role. And also the oral culture, uh, how uh, knowledge was taken through Katha tradition, you know, through performance tradition down to the villages, to the commoners, you know, uh, uh, to the so-called, because in India there was nothing, there was no uneducated or illiterate persona. They were all, you know, uh, educated in mythology, in logic, in mathematics, in philosophy, in different ways. And it did not come through books, through the 
the modes that we look at today. It was also through Katha, it was also through dance form, uh, through music. Uh, so the knowledge tradition, in other words, is so rich that we need to look at it a little differently today and uh, uh, put it coherently for our youngsters to learn from. Um, this uh, conference therefore acquires preeminence to my mind uh, because uh, be it Flint University or be it uh, Harvard or Columbia uh, or Princeton or Nalanda, we need to look at how do we define ideology in today's terms. Uh, do we go by Lecole and uh, you know the number of critics that we have uh, we have over a period of time because right from Macaulay to Hegel uh, to James Mill uh, to Louis Renault who also looked at us as being uh, you know ritualistic or mystical idealist in many many ways Vincent Smith to name some of the critics who put Indic ethos down in many, many ways. And do we also look at scholars, you know, um, right from Aurobindo, who has been mentioned by my friend a number of times. And uh, Aurobindo and, uh, has looked at India from, has not looked at India from the prism of the West. You know, he was trying to define and uh, uh, look at India from its ethos. How do we uh, look at the reality of Indic ethos per se? That was his view of uh, the Indic uh, uh, studies. And uh, to the, the faculty around uh, who may be teaching uh, Indic studies, I would, I would strongly postulate that we look at our cultural history, you know. Uh, cultural history of India could also, you know, not just going by the knowledge tradition, but how has culture evolved over a period of time from the oral traditions uh, to, to moving into the Western uh, way of learning. Most of us are defined uh, by the Western way of learning. So how do we how do we reinvent ourselves? How do institutions look at Indian studies? How do we look at our own culture? How do we redefine it? Uh, how do we choose from our way uh, and, and teach it in different ways? Because uh, India is seen as a knowledge society. Here, knowledge is not power. You know, uh, knowledge here is duty. It's, it's, it's also a kind of responsibility. It is defined through our Purushat. It is defined to, through our Dharma. So uh, Dharma plays a very important role. And uh, the different strands of Indic civilization will lead us to a new pathway if we learn to reimagine Indic studies. I think it's important. We, we need to choose and select um, I would say that we keep away from definitions which have harmed the very Indian identity and ethos, Indian philosophy, and, and we learn to redefine. We create a new set of scholars who will learn to redefine it in terms of Indian ethos, in terms of, you know, in its originality, in its authenticity. Uh, we evolve scholars who are a combination of uh, uh, Sanskritist as well as a rational thinking that the West seem to be giving us. So we need a combination here, you know, where philosophy is merging to each other and, and there's a learning uh, that, that is situated, that is positioned in our own history. The history of religion is very important because religion also plays a very different uh, role in India. It's very different from spiritualism. So when we talk about knowledge traditions, we are talking by and large about the spiritual ethos. 
I think that's very important. And uh, I would strongly recommend that institutions pool their wisdom, the, the reflective tradition of India. How do we uh, uh, create new courses? Uh, how do we audit our existing courses? I think this is very important. Otherwise, learning will never happen. Uh, we will be, the younger generation will be bereft of the knowledge of the ancient tradition. I think it's important to highlight, to refocus, to reimagine, and uh, uh, to channelize the knowledge in different directions and probably uh, come back to its performance traditions as well. You know, look at how institutions can merge different traditions and create a new ethos out of it while keeping with the identity of the Indian ethos. Uh, these were some of the reflections that I had on uh, how we can take another look at Indian civilization. Um, I will leave it to the experts now. I do not claim any expertise in the area. Uh, Baru being a patriot and a devotee of uh, Hindu culture, I would say. Uh, Nalanda itself is uh, uh, on the verge of starting a course on uh, Hindu and Vedic traditions, studies. And uh, we have been looking at it very closely. We have experts who are helping us to formulate courses. And I don't I, I have made it very clear that I do not want a course uh, that, that, that takes away from the originality, uh, from the authenticity of our texts. I am not interested in theorizing uh, Indic civilizations. And I'm not really very keen on uh, looking at what the West had to tell us about us. I would rather look at ourselves you know, with a clear uh, uh, understanding and, and re reread the text. I think this is very important. We need to reread our texts. We need to reinterpret them in 21st century context, the changing scenario, changing times. And I think India will be able to offer to the world a new worldview of what Indian knowledge tradition has been. I think this should be our objective. Uh, let's pool all our wisdom, our reflective tradition, and redraft and reimagine. Uh, with these few words, I wish the conference well. I look forward to listening to some speakers at least while I'm at work. Um, it would be an honor to listen to some of the distinguished speakers here. My best wishes to both Professor Maklan Karanchpe and Professor Jen. Um, and I can see a lot of friends there. Um, uh, my best wishes to all of you out there, the distinguished scholars and the young scholars uh, who are positioned to learn much more about India. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sunana Singh. Your really, uh, in a way, laid the grounds for the sessions to come. And uh, you've been talking about some of these ideas together for several years, if not decades. And I think uh, you all want uh, Nalanda University to really make a mark under your leadership. You're all helping you with that. and. Uh, this uh, interinstitutional cooperation that you talk about, you talk about is, is extremely important. important. And uh, in addition, uh, I was just uh, uh, ruminating on uh, your opening remark about ruins, you know, learning from ruins. And I was just going to, as an English uh, uh, <laughs> professor or student, you know, ruins and runes, R-U-N-E. Rune is this mystic symbolic letter, alphabet or, you know, little mantra. So learning from ruins is like learning from runes. And every ruin 
uh, has a secret uske beech ek raaz chhipa hai aur usi ko khoj rahe hain hum log apni asmita apne astitva ki or ja rahe hain so thank you so much and uh, i want to also welcome uh, many distinguished uh, participants chairs professor ankur barua from cambridge he's got up so early in the morning to be with us thank you thank you professor barua i think it's about 5 5:30 in the morning there in london or in cambridge thank you uh, i want to welcome and i think for pankaj ji uh, what time is it there Oh, it must be namaste it must be pretty late it must be going on to be pretty late pretty late yes it's midnight here almost midnight now. Yeah, exactly yes. so you, you already have that glazed look you know uh, <laughs> you'll be dropping off soon so we'll come to you immediately no, no, no. Uh, i i also see many other distinguished friends and participants uh, professor rajveer sharma i can't see everybody because my screen can only show a few places i see one of a uh, most distinguished uh, philosophers in india today professor s r bhat bhat sahab namaste welcome uh, welcome to you sir thank you for joining us uh, i see i see professor theodor from israel and i see some other friends here so all are welcome our uh, fellows are welcome professor madhav hara ji professor rajvi sharma ji everybody is welcome thank you and uh, i uh, want to say just one more word which is that our opening session was uh, planned from 9 to 10 but i told pankaj ji this is not possible we'll go on till at least 10:30 and then because there are no tea breaks and so forth we have sufficient for the two papers which is by bob thurman by professor robert thurman emeritus at uh, columbia uh, one of the great uh, scholars of buddhism a disciple of his holiness for 50 years or more and of course professor barua will tell us about that and another paper by professor uh, sarao from i think from uh, delhi university sir i see yes. you so you are most welcome yeah. i humbly welcome you sir he will speak on i think he's a professor of buddhism so we welcome you sir so we'll have two papers and we'll close by 12:30 Uh, so that everyone can break for lunch and then we'll come back uh, in the afternoon at 2 o'clock indian time and pankaj ji can be snoozing by then and then he'll join us tomorrow morning again but if you if you feel that you want to get up in the middle of the that night and excite exciting. you jump right in uh, sure. so with these words uh, with these words thank you thank you sunana thank you so much what a lovely sari every time we see you we feel <laughs> uplifted and uh, we are very proud of you we are very proud of your leadership of nalanda uh, and uh, your your visit to chimla is long overdue but uh, please do come and uh, grace us with your presence and uh, pankaj ji all yours now go ahead and about yes, 10 minutes we will turn it yes, over sir. to yes. professor barwa go ahead i'm muting okay. myself right. talking my video right uh, in the interest of time i'll be really really short just i guess i want to share that quotation by professor susan rudolph uh, whose name has been mentioned by both professor paraspe and professor singh uh, but before that i would like to also touch upon my own personal interactions with professor paraspe and professor uh, sunana singh ji uh, just uh, actually last month i was at nalanda the place where professor singh is professor tulana singh is right now and before that if i go back in memory almost 20, exact 20 years back i met professor mukherjee paranch for first time at menla in upstate new york where we had the first uh, you know kind of a similar conference and from so i i see my journey from menla to shimla by nalanda so very <laughs> happy to be here and i i was just about to begin my own academic journey 20 years back when i met professor prashant there in, in new york and now here we are all all of us together again with professor bob thurman and, uh, and and many other senior scholars uh, so I, i'll just mention that quotation by uh, professor susan rudolph from 2005 a, a presidential address at the american political science association's annual meeting in which in which she goes on to say where we got this phrase called imperialism of categories so what she says is this early in our research in india Lloyd Rudolph and I coined the phrase imperialism of categories 
it was meant to designate the academic practice of imposing concepts on the other. The export of concepts as part of a hegemonic relationship. Categories crafted in the dominant socio-cultural environment are exported to a sub subordinate one. The, imperial the imperialism of categories entails an unself-conscious parochialism of categories. Scholars from a dominant culture, sometimes called the center, travel to a distant and lesser place, sometimes called the periphery, where they apply so-called universal concepts. The, the, uh, the trouble is that the concepts have been fashioned out of the center. So, for example, the East is fatalist, says Max Weber. The West, agentic. The non-West conveys status by birth, says Talcott Parsons. The West, by achievement. The non-West is childlike, says John Stuart Mill. The West, mature. Dominant peoples use ideal types and stereotypes to control the dominated by ranking and creating cultural social registers. So this was where we got this phrase of imperialism category that became the theme of this conference and many other conferences that we envision will be will be doing more conferences like this with all of your support and, and cooperation. So, so Rudolf noted that uh, the 21st century's globalization has remained grounded in Euro-American knowledge systems based in Greco-Roman civilizations and Abrahamic religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Knowledge systems inspired by Indic civilization have a great deal to contribute globally, but are not adequately included in Western academia or even India's own academia, even today, which is, uh, you know, we, we have to change that uh, education system, not only in the West, but also in India, to have more Indic civilizational concepts and theories. So the current study of Indic civilization and religions is mostly Western theories, perspectives, and methods. This raises a critical question. How can we present academically, like Professor Singh was also hinting at, how Indic civilization can be presented and taught from Indic categories, Hindu categories, and Indic categories, broadly speaking. Uh, so why do you want to do this? Because I think the knowledge traditions of Indic civilizations can really contribute to global renaissance, not just, you know, we had that European renaissance of four or five centuries ago, but what about a global renaissance in which we can pluralize the globalization process by ensuring inclusivity of Indic civilization and traditions, globalize and pluralize the education systems by addressing the lack of Indic civilization information in K-12 textbooks and syllabi, syllabi, develop a theoretical understanding of Indic contributions to other civilizations, particularly economies and cultures through the Silk Road, Buddhism, colonialism, and the con contemporary IT industry, to name a few, and provide solutions and alternat alternatives to global issues such as environmental concerns, attitudes towards religious diversity, gerontology, psychology, and healthcare. So all, these are some of the objectives why we want to promote more study of more Indic civilization from Indic perspective, which is still lacking, uh, surprisingly, even in India. And uh, I think I'm, I'm aware of probably just one or two more uh, such departments or initiatives, even in India, where Indic study is actually taught. Uh, so Flame University is launching the center of Indic uh, Flame Center of Indic Studies, hopefully soon with this conference and uh, and hopefully more such centers, including at Nalanda and, and elsewhere. We have to all promote each other, support each other and have more students take actual study of India more seriously. Students should go to Nalanda, should go to Shimla, should go to Hampi, should go to Ajanta Elora, should go to Delwada Mandir, should go to so many, so many hundreds of places. My own life, I've been, as I mentioned, in the last 20 years, 30 years now, I, now I, I can, can fully call myself an Indian because I've been to Nalanda now just last month. I've been to both there now last month, just before the second wave hit us. So I, I, just like I have been a lifelong student, and many of us have been lifelong students of India, not just textually, but contextually, by actually going to these great places, like Professor Singh hinted, the learning from ruins and so on. We all have to inspire more students to actually take Indian, Indian studies, Indic studies, Indian civilization studies more seriously, not just textually, but contextually go and immerse ourselves into Indian civilization. So at Flame University, we do have a program called DIP, uh, which is Discover India Project, where we actually, before the pandemic, at least, we, used to, we were sending students all across India and you know work with the local communities, Maldhari communities, such as at the Gir Forest or Bishnoi community in Rajasthan, that learning is the most, I think, important, one of the most important ways to study, to, to learn from India. That's what we have to promote, not just, of course, not just philosophically or theoretically, but 
but by immersing students in Indian civilization, a thriving civilization for thousands of years and hopefully uh, you know, for many, many millennia to come. With these words, I think I'll stop here. And uh, time is also almost 10.30 Indian time. And here almost, yeah, it's freedom at midnight. It's exactly midnight in Dallas now. So <laughs> welcome, Professor Ankur Barua from Cambridge. And you, you accepted our invitation, uh, you know, it's instantly. We're all very grateful for all, all the great scholars that have agreed to share their insights, or share their time. And welcome, Professor Barua. Uh, panel. Thank, you, thank, you, thank you, Professor Jain. Thank you so much for burning the midnight oil uh, <laughs> yes. for the sake of Indology. And without further ado, Professor Barua, all yours. We'll go on till about half past 12. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning to all of you. I think it must be around 10, 30, 11 in, in North India. Although, as you have just heard, it's around midnight for Dr. Jane. Um, I will begin by introducing our two speakers for our uh, the first uh, session. I understand that uh, Professor Terman's uh, lecture is pre-recorded and will be played out for us. I may have to leave around 12 noon, uh, not in their time. Uh, I think Professor Paranjapi will take over. So uh, Professor Robert Thurman, or Bob Thurman, is Professor Emeritus of Indo-Tibetan Buddhology at Columbia University. He is the Editor-in-Chief of the Treasury of Buddhist Sciences, a project of the American Institute of Buddhology and Wisdom Publications. And in 1997, he was named by Time Magazine as one of the 25 most influential Americans. And this will be followed by uh, the lecture of Professor Katia Sarau, who is professor and head at the Department of Buddhist Studies at the University of Delhi. And he has written several books and papers on Buddhism and has been a visiting professor and fellow at several institutes in Asia and Europe. So I think this will be followed by uh, the playing of the recording of Professor Thurman's uh, lecture. Is that right? Yes. Yes, yes, indeed. I think we should. Uh, are you, are you, uh, Professor Barua, do you want to say anything else or shall we play the recording now? I think if you play the recording now, I will say something at the end of it. Perfect, perfect. Okay. So, uh, greetings. Hello, everyone. And uh, Pankaj, thank you so much for inviting me to join your conference. And I'm very happy to give, uh, to record a statement on uh, um, Sanskrit Buddhism. Uh, I decided to give the title. And I'm here in my uh, home in the Catskills. I'm an emeritus professor at Columbia. You may have already introduced me. And um, I'm a Padma Shri from the year 2020, which I'm very, very honored by, and from uh, the President of India. And um, I'm very sad about the current situation in your land, which I feel is sort of like my second homeland, just informally. And um, of course, I, was, I went there first in 1990, and I've always had a strong feeling about Mother India about Mahabharata. So um, anyway, the, the term Sanskrit Buddhism is a term of His Holiness the Dalai Lama's as a way of uh, distinguishing Indian Mahayana Buddhism and Tibetan Mahayana Buddhism from um, the uh, Theravada Buddhism of Sri Lanka and uh, of India also, which was in the Pali language. The scriptures are in the Pali language, which is a theory is that is derived, as you, as many of you probably know, from the Arda Magadhi uh, spoken dialect. I'm talking to you today. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks to Pankaj, uh, for especially, for inviting me. And um, I'm very happy to share with you the um, uh, Sanskrit Buddhism, it's a brief talk on Sanskrit, what I call Sanskrit Buddhism. And in calling that uh, Mahayana, Indian Mahayana Buddhism, Sanskrit Buddhism, I am following the usage of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who um, 
refers to Mahayana Indian Buddhism like that to distinguish it from Nikaya Buddhism or Theravada Buddhism or Mahasangika Buddhism, the basically what we call what I call individual vehicle Buddhism, as a, and Mahayana I call universal vehicle Buddhism. So the Sanskrit Buddhism refers to that, and um, uh, the Mahayana literature itself is uh, subdivided in the Indian and Tibetan traditions into what's called the Paramita Yama or exoteric uh, Mahayana, and then the Vajrayana or Tantrayana, which is the esoteric Mahayana. Although it's called Yana, it's not really a different, it's part of the Mahayana, just the esoteric part of it in the way they understand it. And um, the main body of, the, of Sanskrit Buddhism, unfortunately, the literature or scripture of Sanskrit Buddhism is not any longer in Sanskrit, unfortunately. It's in these books behind me, uh, which are part of them, which are uh, which is an edition uh, of the Tibetan long page book uh, of about five thousand volumes or works, actually maybe three, four, three hundred and some volumes, uh, usually uh, in Tibetan woodblock printing nowadays, um, which are translations into Tibetan, very very. Um, sort of accurate translations uh, because the Tibetan language was created in order to have those translations, make those translations. So it's very close in grammar and everything to Sanskrit. And um, um, it, it, although the words are different, but they very much fit with specific Sanskrit according to a concordance or various concordances that that it, the Sanskrit pundits and Tibetan translators who worked together for about uh, four, five, four centuries to translate the literature of the Nalanda University Library, Vikramashila, Vallabhi, etc., many different uh, uh, Indian Buddhist monastic universities that existed in India in the classical period. And um, so that's the main version. About 10% of that volume of literature we have found, and occasionally they pop up more around 10 to 15 percent of that literature we find a sanskrit manuscript perhaps from nepal or from tibet um or or from some library in a jain library perhaps in india or somewhere occasionally a new one gets discovered and uh, great indian professors in the 19th and 20th centuries uh, did a lot of work people like uh, um uh Jayaswal, the Jayaswal Institute in Patna and other places, they they brought back many from some from Tibet. But it's anyway huge literature. It's kind of a lost literature for Sanskrit, and uh, it has been my pleasure and privilege to work with that literature and help create it. The Indian government and institutions such as the Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies, founded 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, they slowly were translate, recovering, uh, translating back into Sanskrit some of the important works at a very a rather slow pace, but they did some of them. And nowadays, that's the Central University of Tibetan Studies. They still continue that and publish works in their journal and so on. And uh, but um, and there are various movements afoot in Patna and uh, perhaps in Andhra Pradesh to. Uh, try to really implement this where it happens more rapidly. Um, the Dalai Lama, when I first got my PhD in the 19, early 1970s, uh, he urged me to um, found some sort of institution to try to finish the job in bring, uh, bringing this all back to India into the Sanskrit language by three generations, he said. <laughs> when he first said, you have to do that, I thought that was unreasonable. And he said, well, of course you won't finish in your lifetime, but it's three generations if you make an institution, perhaps it will work. Now, the question may be that uh, since uh, India has been getting along okay for 800 years or so, since the burning of Nalanda in 1172 of the Common Era, what's the relevance, what's the relevance of, the collect of this collection of the treasures of its lost library. 
well, it had three major libraries. Uh, actually, Nalanda did one called Ratnodadi, one called Ratnasagara, and what called one called Ratnaranjaka. Uh, basically, considering these scriptures to be jewels, um, they had, and I'm sure many more than the five thousand works that are incorporated in Tibet, in the Tibetan translations. But the Tibetan translations are perhaps some of the most important ones in the curriculum of Nalanda University which therefore would be the ones that the Panditas and the Lodzawas, which is from Loka Chakchuhu in the in Loka, you know, were eye of the world. Uh, the name of a translator in Tibetan, Lodzawa, comes from the Sanskrit, Loka Chakchuhu. And uh, so the nine story tall Ratnodari library, the mountain of whose palm leaf manuscripts took something like six months to burn fully when uh, the, the um, gentleman, the, the military army burned it in 1172. Here I refer to the distinguished Agra University. Now, just to answer that question of what's the relevance of the collection for Indian civilizations, self-understanding, scholarly wise. And here, um, I uh, let me mute that in case any more emails are out. Uh, here I refer to a wonderful thing I discovered years and years ago. The distinguished Agra University scholar philosopher, who incidentally was the grandfather of our beloved late Kapila Vatsyayana, who many of you some may know, uh, who sadly but, but recently passed away. Uh, his name Direndra Dharmendra Nath Shastri. A uh, wonderful scholar, and he wrote a book which was very helpful to me personally in my studies in the old days called Critique of Indian Realism, a masterful study of the Nyaya Vaisheshika systems from the Sutra Karas in the fourth century before the Common Era, all the way to the great Udayana of the Navya Nyaya, very, very late, very, very late. And in his dedicatory Parampara, uh, he has a name that is very hard to spell in Sanskrit, Sherbatsky, uh, Theodore, Sher or he just says Sherbatskaya. He puts it in the dative case in Sanskrit because he's going Namaha, you know, in his, in his Parampara and uh, writing in Devanagari script. And that's S-T-C-H, that uh, B, and then T-S-K. Is it? So that kind of consonant cluster is hard to write in Sanskrit. So when I remember when I first saw it, I thought, who is, what is that? You know, what kind of Indian name is that? And, uh, but it's a Russian name, of course. And uh, he was a great Russian scholar of the late 19th, early 20th centuries. Uh, and his, he wrote a famous book in English uh, called Buddhist Logic, uh, two volumes, which for the first time introduced to modern European philosophers and Indian and English reading uh, philosophers, the great works of Dignaga and Dharmakirti in the fifth and sixth centuries. Uh, and others, there are quite a number of other such writers. So these were residents of Nalanda Monastic University. And um, they were great logicians and epistemologists and very seminal ones. And Professor Shastri then in his introduction preface, he tells the story of how his work, the works of Dignaga and Dharmakirti as introduced to him by the Russian scholar, in, initially in English, uh, uh, Shabetsky, although there are, some of their works do still exist in Sanskrit, Pramana Vartika of Dharmakirti is very well known, and Abhidharma, I mean, um, Pramana uh, Samuchaya um, is, um, well known in, uh, although he's not maybe complete the Sanskrit manuscript of Pramana Samuchaya, but um, uh, Pramana Vartika is. And um, so he, he was able to read those texts, of course, but he was, that were introduced to him by Shabatsky in English. And anyway, he tells the story of how it was like a golden key that he used to unlock the door of mystery, which was which he, uh, what he was mystified about which revealed the connection between the fourth century before the common era, Suttakara's Akshapada and Uddhotakara of the Vaisheshika Sutra and the Nyaya Sutra. And then uh, connecting it to the great um, uh, commentators, such as um, 
Prashastha Pada, Uddhyotakara, and so on, who are many, many centuries later, almost a thousand years later, actually, sixth century of the common era. And there was, and, there, and then Prashastha Pada and Uddhyotakara are debating arguments that he didn't know how to decipher because he didn't know who they were debating with in their commentaries of the Sutrakara. And uh, he said that it wasn't until through Shevatsky he discovered the Buddhist logicians and the Buddhist epistemologists and the Buddhist realists, you could say, um, uh, they, especially Dignaga and Dharmakirti, uh, somewhat also Vesamandu Asanga, who for the fifth century. And uh, who was, uh, Vesamandu was perhaps the grand teacher of of Dignaga. And um, so he writes about them thanking uh, Sherbatsky for introducing that. And he mentions actually, he takes trouble in that preface to mention that before he found that, he was really having a problem. And he went to the Vid Sanskrit Vidyalayas in Banaras, Varanasi, in uh, Calcutta, in Mumbai, wherever he found great pundits. And he tried to query them about this middle, this gap of a thousand year gap, really, between Sudhakara and, and the great uh, commentary, Shastra writers. And um, they, no one could really solve the problem for him because the greatest pundits themselves did not, at that time, know the work of the Buddhist uh, scholars. Because although there, may, there were Sanskrit manuscripts of some of their major works, maybe not all of their works, they were not well known, they were not well studied, and um, it was, you know, since they were Buddhists and Buddhists were gone, they, they didn't know about that. So it's a marvelous, you know. I loved, I, well, I loved it myself. I, thought, I took it to my Sanskrit professor at Harvard, who was wondering why I was so interested in Buddhism and also in Sanskrit, and he thought maybe I should switch to study the Puranas or something. And the Vedas, particularly, he thought I would enjoy the Vedas, and I did enjoy them. But uh, um, I, I was—I'm interested in Sanskrit Buddhism, obviously. So uh, another clue comes from another American scholar uh, named Walter Eugene Clark, who was Professor Ingalls, my guru, Sanskrit guru at Harvard. He was his teacher in the, up through the '40s. And he actually was the president of the American Oriental Society in, in the year 1947. And he gave a presidential address. And I couldn't find my old copy of that, and I couldn't find it online. But uh, it was a very signal, important uh, document in um, American and uh, European um, Indian studies. And uh, in his presidential address to the assembled Sanskritists, he said that the most important task for the next generation, including his student, Professor Ingalls, was to learn Tibetan and to study the Indian Shastras that no longer can be found in Sanskrit and in Tibetan and hopefully translate some of them back. And in every stream in the Vedanta stream of the Shaddarshanas, for example, also in poetics, kavya and things, in every stream of Indian classical civilization, there's this gap between seminal events that happen around Buddha's time, Upanishadic time, the reign of the Takshila, the great Takshila monastery, you know, university in the, in the north northwest India at that time, northwest Parata at that time, um, and um, and then there's a long gap. In, the, in all of the different um, strands, you know, of the darshanas and so on, where before major commentarial and debate and things come up, and when the debates do come up, the big debatant, the other side, the opposition party, so to speak, are the Buddhists often. There's an intra, intra darshana debates, of course, as well, but, and uh, debates between different Vedantic commentators and so on, but, about the way of interpreting Brahma Sutra and whatever it is. But basically between the basic sutras and the elaborated people, there's this big gap. And what is the gap according to Clark, his Clark's researchers at the time, it is that the great Brahmin scholars and, and, uh, and some 
and, and, and the great scholars from other castes uh, during that long period were mostly in Buddhist monastic universities or engaged in Buddhist things because the Indian kings were not supporting big academies kind of thing. And the, the Buddhist uh, Sangha was a major, major, as from the time of Ashoka on especially, was a major, major institution. And that's where the sort of university sort of style type pluralistic multi-class or multi-caste uh, education, you know, the edu minds were gathering and they were writing in the veins like that, although they were not all Buddhists because those universities also taught lay people and also taught people. They didn't, in those ancient days, they didn't really use the word Buddhism, Bauda, you know, that much. They used the, uh, Adhyatmika was one term, Nangva, as the, um, Tibetans also still use that phrase, Nangba, an insider or an inner scientist. And um, and then uh, and, uh, Sangha, they referred to the Buddhist community as Sangha. And, um, and Vihara, the Sangha Vihara with the monasteries and the universities. So the word Bauda doesn't really come until quite later. But in that period, 400, 500 or so BCE to 4, 500 CE, the, the learning and a lot of the writing and a lot of the development of thought is taking place in the Buddhist monastic universities. And that gap is a big gap in India's self-understanding. That was, that was Clark's thesis, basically. And actually, he had some personality, personality differences with his primary student, his superior student, who was Daniel Ingalls, who was my teacher, because somehow Ingalls didn't completely agree with Clark's view, and he precisely did not focus on Buddhist studies, um, Sanskrit Buddhist studies, and he, even a student such as me, who came already from a Tibetan interested side, uh, he tried to encourage me to read non-Buddhist writings more. And he, he even once said, hey, how can you stand always in that Buddhist literature? They were such a bunch of damn goody goodies, he said. <laughs> He said, so I said, well, Dan, it, although they may have been goody goodies, you, if you met one at night on the dark street or somewhere or in the wilderness, you would like to meet a goody goody, not a baddie baddie. I said, <laughs> and he laughed. And actually, after he retired, he kind of joined up in the Sanskrit Buddhism thing where he used to have private readings when he was emeritus at Harvard. And some of his old students who were in the New, Le New England area where I was teaching in those days at Amherst College. And, uh, and so occasionally I had some semesters of teaching at Harvard also. And uh, he, he would hold readings in his apartment in, on the Charles River. And some of, you know, 10, 12 of us or something would gather from neighboring schools. And some of his graduate students, even advanced graduate students would come. And he was reading the Divyavadana, and he started reading more Buddhist texts, actually, for some reason. And he, when he read them, he would sparkle with the beauty, you know. I'll never forget one particular, the first one where I was particularly astonished, and then I made sure to go every time after that, where he read the Divya, he was reading in the Ashokavadana section of the Divyavadana. And it's where the Buddha meets Ashoka in a previous life of Ashoka, Shakyamuni does as a little kid, and the little kid is playing in a sandbox. I won't tell the whole story, but he meets that. But anyway, there's a passage in the text where the Buddha puts his foot on the threshold of a city, the city where the previous life of Ashoka, according to the Abhidharma, was living. And when the minute he put his foot on there, the blind could see, the cripples stood up, etc., and the light rays came out of his teeth, you know, when he smiled, and it really, one, almost like a bhakti literature from the Divya Avadana in Sanskrit. Really, really amazing. And the way that Professor Ingalls would light up when, when uh, his imagination going with the Sanskrit to sort of see it as a vision, as a fantasy perhaps, if you will, or a vision. He, would, he really liked it, so he would continue reading that eventually. But he, during his professional life, he did not much follow Clark's injunctions, let's say. So I have about, you know, then about this treasury of, in, of Sanskrit Buddhism in Tibetan language, with Sanskrit derived Tibetan language. Um, I have an analogy for 
Indian scholars today who may wonder if it really is that important. And my analogy is Indiana Jones, you know, being American, I refer to Indiana Jones, the movie character. And Indiana Jones is walking around in Ethiopia looking to find some artifact to make money as a dealer, right, as an art finder. And uh, he falls in a hole somewhere, you know, and, and, you know, defies death, you know, the way it was does. And then he finds himself in an underground enormous library with many, many volumes and uh, in Ethiopic language, along with some dictionaries and concordances and reference works. And then after some investigation, you know, he, he robs a couple of copies and he runs off somewhere and has them evaluated. And then he really, it's, it becomes known that this is a complete set of translations of the most important works, all of them, of the Library of Alexandria, which was burnt in the third century, as you know, by Clement, the Bishop Clement of Alexandria, who was a fanatic and who didn't like classical learning, which we, that burning then reduced the number of codices, as they call them, of the ancient classical Mediterranean world in Aramaic, Greek, and Latin, it reduced them to only around 30,000 different copies. And uh, whereas um, work, 30,000 different works or something, according to, um, um, the, uh, what's his name? I'm sorry, the Oxford scholar, a friend of mine, but I just can't remember his name right now, but according to him. And uh, whereas of course the Indian literature in itself is millions of books and the libraries of, um, Nalanda and other such monasteries must have been in the hundreds of thousands. And um, so it's like that. Then the, in the West, Western Mediterranean, Euro-American sort of type scholars would just flip out over that and there'd be a huge government thing and big, huge grants and lots of people learning to translate the works and they would do a bang up job of recovering the larger volume of the works of the Library of Alexandria within two decades, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, by putting huge manpower and funding and effort into it. So this Thendur, Conjur and Thendur collections of translations from Sanskrit, uh, mostly, some, some, uh, some dialect, you know, Prakrit languages, but mostly Sanskrit, almost entirely Sanskrit. And this would create a huge literature that would fill the gap during the ascendancy of the Buddhist monastic universities, which you could count as almost a thousand years, maybe 800 years or something. So it would really enrich the picture of like where bhakti came from, where different things like, you know, Shankara, Gaudapada, you know, you have the little clues like Gaudapada, for example, in his Mandukya Karika uh, commentary, he, um, uh, Mandukya Upanishad commentary, Mandukya Karika, he salutes in his parampara Buddha as well as, um, you know, Vajrayana and others. And uh, in his Vedanta, elaboration of Vedanta, and he supposedly is the grand teacher of Shankara, you know, some generations before him. And um, there's so, but, but no one knows the writing of of um, the great Mahathir, you know, Buddha Palita, you know, we know, know about Nagarjuna, but the other Baba Viveka and people like that, who wrote amazing works in Sanskrit, were great. They were all Brahmins and well-educated before they became Buddhist monks or Buddhist professors, and they wrote extraordinary works. You know? So, so that's, a, that's that analogy. And um, so that's what you have. And uh, it's something that, that I hope in my emeritus years to put a lot of effort in to spend time in India and to hopefully with young Indian scholars and Tibetan scholars and, and people from Japan, China, from all over the world to uh, really try to restore into the modern languages, of course, but also into Sanskrit and Telugu and Tamil and these languages so that the Indian education system and cultural scholarly system has, a, has a access to its own treasures, actually. This actually fits with um, so in a way, it's adding a lost half. So again, now I want to refer also to my um, my dear friend again, late sadly, uh, Lalmani Joshi, who was the 
uh, director of the Guru Gobind Singh World Religion Center in Patiala University for many years. And then he was shifting to Varanasi at one point, but sadly died on the way, you know, many now, 20, 30 years ago, but uh, in the prime of his life and his career. And so we didn't have further works from him, but, but the work he did work, you know, the studies in the you classical know, the studies in the classical civilization of, of India, uh, or of classical India, perhaps Buddhist civilization of classic India. Um, he then puts forth a thesis, I think, following his guru, G.C. Pandey of Gorakhpur University. And he, sa he said that the Hinduism is not to be thought of accurately as only coming from the Vedic strand, the Vedic strand, I could say, because there is another strand which he called the Shramanic strand, and the two living, two currently existing uh, main movements of that strand are the Jainism and Buddhism, of course, although then Sanskrit Buddhism got lost in India a thousand years ago, but it still exists, of course, in, in Tibet and China and all over East Asia and in Sri Lanka and Burma and everywhere. <clears throat> but it got kind of lost to India. So he, but that shamanic, the Jainist, Jains luckily survived and persisted. But um, the, these two strands uh, represent the other half of the contributing stream to the river or the Ganga river of Hindu civilization or Hinduism. But the shamanic one, and many of the things like nonviolence, you know, like, uh, uh, one, one, one guru in Mathura, one of the centers there, uh, he gave me a little instruction one afternoon a few years ago, and he said that he felt very grateful to Shakyamuni Buddha, of course, Vishnu's ninth avatar, uh, for having stopped the blood sacrifices, the animal sacrifices and so forth, in uh, ancient Vedic practice. And... Um, and then he was critical of Tibetans because they are very carn carnivores, you know. They do eat meat uh, because of the way their economy was in Tibet. Although the Dalai Lama, perhaps in response to that guru's advice, because I took that message to the Dalai Lama, or maybe just himself anyway, um, had turned all the big Buddhist monasteries, monastic universities in South India and elsewhere, and they don't serve meat in the monasteries at all. And they don't buy meat and they have no butcher, they managed to live well as uh, in veg in veg with a veg diet. Monks are allowed, of course, to go off somewhere in town or something when on holidays or something. And they, maybe they can indulge their cultural Tibetan habit, but uh, they, the monasteries don't do it. So anyway, Lalmani Joshi, I thought I, I found his thesis very persuasive, and other scholars like the Dutch and uh, some of the Bhattacharyas and others, I think, might read in some sense. But um, in that light, when you see the axial age in India, you know, in the middle of the first millennium before the common era, you see the Buddhists and the Jains as really the more radical members of those introducing the concept of moksha into the Hindu stream. And um, then the Upanishads come along with that while trying to connect that back to the Vedas and the Brahmanas and the Aranyakas and so forth which had been only a tight, very thin vein in the main activist karma yoga, you could say, philosophy of the Vedas. And so the jnana yoga, the whole jnana yoga contribution is really more comes strongly from the Shramana line. And then finally in the Gita, as we all know, I mean, this is thumbnail for you, but just in relation to that, then he's the one who connects both karma yoga, jnana yoga, and bhakti yoga in the real final Hindu synthesis. But the jnana yoga component may well be due, and the credit may be due to the shramana lineage. And to really understand the Indian scriptures of the shramana lineage, the biggest body, a body of them, you need to make this um, voyage to Tibet and recover that. And luckily, uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama considers that his fourth major aim of life as a son of India, he calls himself son of Nalanda, sometimes he says, sometimes son of India, because he has been in India in exile by the generosity and kindness of Nidhuji and all the Nidhujis, and then by the rest of the Indian population uh, for, since 1959, which makes it 61, 62 years now. 
And uh, he said, therefore, I have had more rice and dal than whatever Tibetan food I ate for my first 24 years. Because <laughs> he's 85, so he's had three quarters of his body is constituted by rice and dal, he likes to, he says in, in a funny way. So anyway, as a son of India and son of Nalanda University, monastic university, his fourth aim in life after, you know, as a human working for human beings, as a Buddhist working for better understanding amongst world religions, and as a Tibetan speaking up for the plight of the Tibetans under the Chinese genocide, uh, genocidal policies, and uh, as, a, as a son of India, Nalanda, his fourth aim is bringing, helping to bring back India's own mainstream inner sciences, the sort of complementary part of it, let's say. India, of course, the Shadarshanas are the root of the Indian sciences, the Hindu sciences, you could call the Hindu sciences, but the real overall Indian sciences where you have a pluralistic debate, Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, et cetera, whoever is there, in the wonderful Indian pluralism that the Dalai Lama so admires, along with its democracy, uh, the this Buddhist scriptural contribution, Sanskrit Buddhism, is a huge, huge contribution. And he and the Tibetans, therefore, he's wanted to do that. And some of them have trained in Sanskrit. He would love it, of course, if many more would institute curricula in Sanskrit in the in the long run in the Buddhist monastic universities in South India. That should be the case. I had a graduate student who had that ambition, actually. And he's young, and he may, but unfortunately, he became ill. He wasn't really able to accomplish it so far, but someone will. So finally, the, uh, so, uh, so that's that. So then when you understand the Upanishads as interactive with the Jain and Buddhist movements, the Shramana movements, then you understand them better. And you, and you understand the whole issue of moksha and jnana as a fourth ashrama, you know, a fourth aim of life, and um, of jnana yoga in the Gita, you understand its source more, better. And um, then the other, th the other element, which only more recently I've been thinking about, is if you know more of the Buddhist bodhisattva literature, the sort of devotionalist literature in Buddhism, we might find a contributing source to the marvelous Indian movements of bhakti. One of India's greatest contributions in world religions is the intense, passionate, devoted bhakti tradition as a mass tradition, not just a few mystics, but a, but a mass tradition. You know, set, you know, like holidays like Holy He and, uh, and um, you know, festivals of light and festivals of color and things like that. And then the serious love of Shiva and love of Krishna and love of Rama, you know, there was really bhakti thing. And how, you know, the Vedic deities were not exactly lovable. They were a little more rough and tough. There were, and there were no females, basically, except for to be Mother Earth and Ushas. That's about it for the, in the Vedas. And, um, and um, uh, not, you know, there weren't any important female deities. There were Savitri and other things important female figures, but not deities. And yet suddenly, now you suddenly get Shakti and Shiva and Uma and um, Meenakshi and all this thing. Where does all this bhakti, this devotion, and the idea that God loves you and you love God, and where does that love connection come from as a mass movement, not just a priestly movement, and where that comes could be the bodhisattva idea you know, after the time, after Ashoka, and then after Mahayana, when Mahayana Sanskrit Buddhism starts to come up, um, uh, then then that's where the bhakti may have an influence, or a contributing factor. Nobody's trying to claim total credit, but source credit. But there's a, you understand better the Bhagavatam and these kind of things and where they come from and what influenced them. And... Um, and finally, of course, uh, in Hinduism, the theory of karma and the idea of being reborn by according to what your ethical action is was a big innovation of the shramanas. Because in the Vedic cult, karma meant ritual action because that was powerful action that affected your destiny because um, 
the gods controlled your destiny in the pre-moksha Vedas, you know, the early Vedas, the ritualistic ceremonial Veda. And only later, at the time of the Shramana movements, in their own right, that Buddhism, Jainism, Ajivakism, etc., other ones that didn't last, um, and then the and then codified also sort of orthodoxically in the Upanishads. Um, the, there is no source for this loving business. Kings also don't love you. They are, have the danda. They beat you up. They have the divine right of kings. But after Ashoka, uh, then the, he this is, and after some of the Buddhist texts and Buddhists like the Aganya Sutta and the Mahasamatha theory of kingship, for example, then you get a very you get these new contributions, and so the, the the idea that the powerful karma is not ritual action, but is ethical action, that idea definitely has to be attributed to the shamanas. So again, that literature is very valuable to understand that what I consider is from karma theory, as elaborated by Buddha, to have been to be a kind of biological theory explaining the variety of living be forms and living beings, kind of an ancient Indian Darwin theory but one that is for the individual, not only for the species, for the individual, their individual life and re-life and life and death and re rebirth and then re-death and rebirth and re-death and rebirth. So that whole theory. So in early Upanishads, you, it's not so clear that everybody gets reborn except going to the lag ground of the ancestors, if you're lucky. Anyway, finally, the non-dual as an individual, in other words. Finally, the non-dualism in philosophy and science and the revaluation of the body is deeply key to spiritual evolution and thus the source of non the source of tantra and thus the emergence of tantra as the neurological science and contemplative art of accelerating spiritual and physical evolution toward human enlightenment emerged also from the Mahayana Sanskrit culture and needs us to know something about that culture. So Anyway, in that culture, the five sciences, and this is germane to the idea, you know, which is alive in India, but not necessarily yet very effectively implemented, which is the reconstruction and the re restoration of India, one of the jewels of classical India, which was the Nalanda Monastic University. And, the, you know, there's a move, there has been a move to make a new Nalanda University as a worldwide center, not only for Buddhists, but as a great university, and people worked on it. There have been pros and cons about it, but um, actually it would have to go back to the core curriculum of the Sanskrit Buddhism. And in that, Adhyatma Vidya becomes the king of all sciences. That's society, like psychology and philosophy. Then Hetu Vidya, that's a, and, uh, that's a logic, epistemology, and the rules of debate. That's very important for learning. Shadda Vidya, grammar, of course. You know, and then multilingual, now multilanguage grammar that is involved in the pluralistic India. Chikitsa vidya, so medicine, but a mind body type of medicine that allowed for mind, not like modern materialist sciences, what I call industrial medicine. And then finally, the engineering and architecture and arts, Shilpa, Shilpasana vidya, you know, these are the ancient five sciences of the great monastic universities and so on. And there are many works in all of those fields, not just in Buddhist do doctrines and so on in that collection. And um, so anyway, that's my talk. I think that's long enough, uh, maybe too long. It's been about 45 minutes. And I'm so I shared these ideas with you. And um, um, on the basis of the pages of notes that I made, and um, I could talk for a long time about the, all the monastic university system based on the works of your own great uh, Dutt, the, 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 the family of the Dutts, the different Dutts and the Bhattacharyas and the other great Indian scholars who have traced that history and um, would be delighted to do so. But this is just my brief talk on this topic and, um, and the announce, and in which also I am announcing an intention I have with a charitable foundation partner in India and an Indian Buddhist monk to develop a center to really intensify and uh, get worldwide support and Indian government support for both state and, and uh, federal uh, to, um, to really put this in, in high gear and to really restore this literature en masse.
Um, and this was, I was charged with this. I won't be able to get much more done. I did a few books myself in my life, in my scholarly life, but um, only a fair few. There are thousands to do. And it's a wonderful scholarly field. So I hope younger scholars, if any of them happen to hear this talk or be at this conference, that they might consider looking into that, learn Tibetan and learn Buddhist Sanskrit and, um, and look into the treasures of Sanskrit Buddhism as found in the Kanjur and Denjur collections uh, of um, that are printed actually in Tibetan Buddhist monasteries and there are copies of them all over the world in different universities by now and so on. Okay, so thank you very much Pankaj and friends. And I hope this will be useful bringing this perspective to you. Thank you very much. So, uh, greetings. So that was uh, absolutely stunning, fascinating, stimulating. Uh, I have a couple of comments, but maybe I'll defer them. I uh, definitely want to hear from Professor Parua. He has to leave at uh, noon. So I request him to make his uh, chair remarks now, and then we will go on to the next uh, speaker, Professor Sarao. And if you have to leave in the middle, that's OK, uh, Professor Parua. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. So please make your presidential remarks now, and uh, then we'll invite the next speaker. Professor uh, Thurman, we are present here now. I would thank him deeply for his uh, talk. Um, I will not speak at length, but I will highlight one theme which partly touches on Professor Thurman's talk just now. Now, as it so happens, I have been invited to write an introductory book which is aimed at undergraduate students titled, What is Hindu Philosophy? And this is by far the most challenging book I have set out to write, not least because I have to write it in about 60,000 words. Now, one leitmotif of this book is an attempt to highlight and also critique the continuing misrepresentation of Indic thought as deeply anti-rational in the sense that it lacks conceptual structure and logical rigor. So we often meet people in departments of analytic philosophy. I mean, I myself have taught in such departments who claim that philosophy, strictly speaking, does not exist in Sanskritic milieus. And what they mean by philosophy here is a style of reasoned discourse. And it is claimed that such a style is absent in Indian worldviews. Now, for me, nothing could be further from the truth, a lot of my research in these Sanskritic traditions focuses on dialectical engagements across the system of Nyaya and Buddhist philosophers, and across the system of Advaita Vedanta and Buddhist philosophers. Now, these engagements, they operated through the medium of the discussion, the reason the discussion, or Vada, in which one uh, dialogical partner presents one's own viewpoint, then systematically presents the viewpoint of the opponent, then points to various inconsistencies in the viewpoint of the opponent, and only then offers one's conclusive standpoint or siddhanta. So what this means is that these groups, these dialogical participants in this Vada framework of discourse, they share some basic rules of engagement in rational space. So certain moves are allowed and some are not. And before you are invited to speak in such uh, forums, you have to first learn the ropes of what are these rules. Now, what is crucial to note about this form of philosophical reasoned engagement is that it is not sufficient simply to say, this is what I believe and you are wrong, true stop. Or even worse, what I believe is obviously right and you are just plain stupid, true stop. It is very important to be able to present the viewpoint of the opponent, the Purva Paksha, in the Purva Paksha's own terms. 
So let's say I'm a Nyaya philosopher in the 10th century or the 11th century, and everyone here are, uh, is a Buddhist philosopher. I should be able to present the Buddhist standpoint with such accuracy and such sensitivity that you listen to me and you say, yes, that is indeed a correct statement of the Buddhist worldview. Having done that, of course, I won't stop there. I will highlight various conceptual problems, perhaps logical fallacies that I claim to see in the Buddhist viewpoint. And I, and then, of course, you will try to refute my refutations, and I will not stop there. I will try to refute your counter refutations, and this is how the dialectical spiral becomes more and more involved and complicated. And therefore, what that means is that, let's say, sometime between the first century of the common era to roughly the eighth century of the common era, some patterns of Hindu Buddhist dialectics became extremely intricate. So much so that sometimes to understand the Hindu viewpoint, you have to understand the Buddhist viewpoint and vice versa. For instance, some of the most concise outlines of Advaita can be found in the writings of Buddhist philosophers or scholars or commentators, just as some of the most concise and precise descriptions of Buddhist epistemology can be found in the commentarial traditions of Nyaya. And what I find most remarkable about this style of dialectics is the attempt to help the opponent to develop their own view, not just my own view. So imagine a Nyaya scholar saying to a Buddhist, look, I think your claim about the not-self or anatman is not properly articulated. The way in which you have presented this claim right now is actually very weak. But why don't you let me help you to improve your articulation? This does not mean, of course, that the Nyaya scholar becomes a Buddhist overnight. But it does mean that one has to be able to engage. That is, it does mean that to be able to engage in rational argumentation, you have to be able to meet the oppressor, the opponent, not the oppressor on the opponent's own grounds. And the type of Sanskrit that some Buddhist scholars developed in these dialectical streams is sometimes called Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. And this is a style of Sanskrit where certain terms have very specific meanings. Consider the word Swabhava, uh, the Sanskrit word, which is also used in many modern Indian languages. And in these linguistic milieus, the word roughly means nature or habitual disposition and so on. However, Buddhist thinkers, figures, commentators such as Nagarjuna and Chandrakirti use this word Swabhava in a quite technical sense, which is something that derives its existence from itself so that it is not dependently originated. Now, there is a vast field of literature out there one can work on. For instance, one can work on the interactions between Hindu and Buddhist thinkers on the motive of impermanence or reality or being or consciousness or means of knowledge, pramana, so on. For another, as Professor Thurman was indicating a while ago, the resonances between bhakti in Hindu worldviews and devotion towards the Bodhisattva in Mahayana Buddhism. Here is just a skeletal preview of a famous debate. Uh, which highlights my point about the Vada system and the Pramana system of argumentation. Suppose the Buddhist says, everything is impermanent, that is, everything is momentary. A Vedantic respondent will typically say, well, if everything is momentary, then the individual who enunciates this claim is itself momentary. Now, that may look like a conclusive refutation, but it is not. Because the Buddhists will return with a more sophisticated articulation of this claim. The Vedantic respondent will typically not be satisfied and develop yet another line of critique. And this is how one layer of definition, reasoning, and rational engagement becomes enfolded in another layer. So that sometimes it is difficult to extricate one layer from the other. One simply does not know sometimes who is speaking, who is arguing, who is refuting who is offering a counter refutation. Now, sadly, Hindu-Buddhist dialectical engagement of this type gradually died out in North India by the 10th century. Some people dated to about the 12th century. And the focus of scholarly argumentation moved to Tibetan monasteries, as Professor Thurman was pointing out a while ago. 
However, I believe that there is still a lot to learn from this form of dialectics. And as I conclude my reflections, here is one for all of us. There is one point that we can still learn from this vanished form of dialectics in the 10th century, which is that to be able to state the viewpoint of your opponent with such precision that your opponent agrees that, wow, I could not have said it better. And so that is the golden standard, the hallmark of the Veda structure of argumentation, that you tell your opponent what the opponent believes and the opponent realizes for the first time that indeed is what I have been trying to say. And that is a very, very difficult, demanding epistemic virtue to cultivate. And precisely for that reason, I think that is why we should try to cultivate that virtue. And that is all I have to say. It's not really a presidential remark or anything like that, as Professor Paranjip would say. Uh, uh, these are just some impromptu uh, responses to what uh, Professor Furman was saying. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Professor Parwa. That was really brilliant, very, very useful. And uh, I love the way you started with the refutation of the notion that uh, India did not have argumentative or analytical traditions, and that uh, the rational mode of engagement is something that is people of poverty. And this is so obviously and patently untrue that uh, uh, even, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Ambedkar, who started by deriving rationality from the European Enlightenment and French Revolution, uh, in the end, in the Buddha and his Dhamma, went back to Indian sources. I think we'll have time around noon after we hear Professor Sarau and his presentation to have a discussion. I butted in just now only to thank you, Professor Barwa. If you have to leave at noon, when okay. Professor Rao is speaking, no problem. Thank you, and we hope to join. We hope that you join us another time once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Barwa. So I think uh, Professor uh, Sarau will speak. I invite him to speak now. Thank you. you also, much, Professor, Professor Sarau, Sarau, briefly introduce yourself. Uh, yes, please briefly was, introduce yourself. Uh, I uh, retired one year ago from Delhi University. I was the head of the department of Buddhist studies. I taught at Delhi University for about uh, 41 years. And uh, I did a PhD in uh, Buddhist history from Delhi University and uh, another in archaeology and Pali literature from Cambridge. Uh, I uh, shall be talking on uh, uh, the Victorian Indologists, uh, their role, particularly in the uh, Mahabodhi Temple of Bodhiya controversy and uh, the role of uh, Angarik Dharampal. Uh, because there is quite a bit of time, uh, I'll uh, begin with uh, the background to uh, this controversy. Perhaps you are aware that uh, when the Buddha uh, comes under the uh, comes and sits under the Mahabodhi the under the uh, people tree that became known as the Mahabodhi tree. This place was already being worshipped by the local people. Uh, tree worship has been part of uh, the Indian civilization since prehistoric period. We have sufficient. Evidence. In fact, when uh, Sujata came to offer uh, a meal to the Buddha, she uh, thought he was uh, some kind of tree sprite or some tree god. So this kind of uh, uh, practice was very popular in India, tree worship. And uh, so this uh, tree uh, was already being worshipped. Perhaps there was a small shrine underneath this tree. And uh, of course, this tree became very popular uh, after the Buddha's enlightenment. And uh, when Ashoka visited this place, he built a small Bodhi ghar. But the towered temple that we see uh, that I think was built by the Sri Lankans, not uh, not Indians. Uh, as a single deep, Sri Lanka was apparently one of the feudatory uh, states of Smudragupta. That is what Smudragupta mentions in his Allahabad Prashasti. 
and apparently the Sri Lankan king approached uh, Smudra Gupta for uh, uh, allotment of some space uh, near the Mahabodhi tree and the shrine uh, so that Sri Lankan pilgrims could, uh, could stay there. They, they, they had difficulties in finding accommodation in that area. And it seems that uh, Smudra Gupta gave uh, some sort of extraterritorial right to the Sri Lankans. And uh, it is because of that we do not uh, come across any donations or land grants made by the Gupta kings to the, uh, to the place which became known later on as the Mahabodhi Temple complex. Some, some people accuse uh, or say raise a finger against the Gupta kings that they were anti-Buddhist and they did not make any donations uh, to the, uh, this Mahabodhi uh, temple and the tree. Whereas they were making a massive amount of grants here and there. But I think the explanation for that is that uh, uh, because uh, the whole uh, area was kind of uh, given extra territorially to the Sri Lankans. And so Sri Lankans were in control of this. And so everything was being done by the Sri Lankans. And uh, perhaps this temple was built by the Sri Lankans themselves. And this kind of psyche of the Sri Lankans appears quite apparent in the accounts of various visitors to this place uh, who uh, indicate particularly the Tibetans that the Sri Lankans were very, very possessive about uh, this uh, temple and this, this complex. For example, uh, 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 one uh, popular Tibetan uh, monk uh, was not allowed to enter the premises of this temple because uh, he was carrying a copy of the Pragyaparamita Sutra. The Sri Lankan monk who was in control of this temple at the time, he said that oh, Pragyaparamita Sutra is not a Buddhist text. It is some kind of Mara text and you have to throw it away. Take uh, a bath in the uh, Nilanjana river and only then you will be allowed to enter the, this uh, temple complex. So Dham Swamin uh, actually had to uh, leave the text. Uh, away only then he was allowed to accept it. Anyway, now uh, when uh, Bhaktiar Khalji um, uh, attacked this region, uh, uh, most of the monks were either killed or they uh, had to uh, move into other areas of India or move towards Nepal and Tibet or uh, Orissa. And uh, so the temple was abandoned completely. After about uh, 1234, so we do not uh, come across uh, much information about this temple after that. And then uh, a Hindu sannyasi of the Shaivite uh, Parampara saw this temple abandoned and he started living here and started looking after this temple and continued to do so into the modern times. And uh, this monk was able to get grants from the Mughal Empire of about 3,000 acres of land, including the land on which the temple had been built. So various farmans were issued by the uh, Mughal government in favor of uh, the uh, Mahant. And so Mahant basically became the owner of the entire land, including the temple. And uh, once uh, the Mughals uh, had uh, sort of established some sort of Aman and Chan in this area, pilgrims from Thailand, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, and uh, Tibet began coming here. And they were pretty happy the way the Shaivite Mahant was looking after the temple or other Mahants uh, of that temple. Now, uh, what I have tried to uh, submit in my paper is the kind of controversy that was created by the Victorian Indologists through their own in interpretation of Buddhism and Hinduism, and how they tried to show these two religions as irreconcilably different and diverse. And then Anadharik Dharampal was used as a tool to create the kind of mess that happened not only around the Mahabodhi temple, but in the whole of uh, India. We had not come across any kind of persecution of Buddhists or any communal rights in India. In fact, it is very interesting to see that uh, during the ancient period, 
you do not come across a single proper example of any kind of communal riots which were sponsored by the state. If anybody was persecuted on communal lines, it could be seen only as an individual case of crime. The state or the society at large did not really have this kind of issue, Buddhism versus Hinduism. So this was the kind of creation of the Victorian Indologists. And very interestingly, when you look at the study of uh, Buddhism uh, during the ancient period, or the history of uh, ancient India, the left as well as the right, both agree. Even scholars like Romila Thapar, they agree that it is almost impossible to find an example of a king or state-sponsored example where one community was persecuted, targeted. So even the examples of uh, Shashank or Kushamitra Shunga are seen as cooked up, made up examples of persecution. Uh, they were not persecutors of Buddhists or Hindus or whatever. Now, uh, could I share the screen? I would like to make a PPT presentation. Uh, there is a share button bottom of the screen. Mein yeah, I, 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 yes. Professor Rao, we can't hear you. The screen is absolutely clearly visible, but we can't hear you. Uh, no, we. I think you should unmute yourself, if you don't mind, Professor Sarao. Uh, we can't hear you. System analyst, kuch uh, problem aari hai, uh, sir ke oh, audio. Okay, okay. Great, Hello. great, yeah, 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 okay. yeah. Okay. fantastic. Okay. Coming through, okay. fantastic. Thank you. Right. Uh, all right. Sorry, let me start. I think I'll just use my computer like this, otherwise it uh, might get muted again. So what I have uh, submitted in my paper is that uh, the uh, colonial masters uh, of India, by virtue of their ownership of uh, uh, the tax and uh, control of these tax, and by being the only ones who were uh, in a position to read these tax, the, this privilege allowed these uh, colonial masters to ideologically control the interpretation of these tax and also the power and freedom to put their colonial agenda into practice on the basis of the so-called scientific study of these texts. In this colonial agenda, a particular form of Buddhism was manufactured for the Victorian world, and this was used as a tool in the colonial policies against Hinduism, by showing that the two religions are irreconcilably different from each other. And uh, so, this Buddhism manufactured by the Victorian Indologists that was founded by a man, according to uh, the, uh, some of the scholars, uh, founded by a man with thick Ethiopian lips an African Negro-like black frizzled hair, but he was the grandest and the purest, but only after Christianity. 
of all the Eastern religions, and hence was even a formidable rival to Jesus Christ. At the same time, European interpretations of Hinduism were, on the whole, rather unsympathetic and the attitude of the majority of the Europeans was always almost either ridicule and disgust. And their accounts largely focused on limitless gods and goddesses, repulsive images, and barbarous customs of the Hindus. Brahmanism was portrayed as the most foul and soul polluting creed in which you could here, the frenzied shrieks of a widow on the funeral pyre and the dying groans of devotees being crushed under the wheels of Jagannath, drowned by the horrid music of these Brahmins. In fact, we were told by these Victorian Indologists that it was this kind of depravity of Hinduism that motivated the Buddha to leave his home, what we call in Pali and Sanskrit Abhinishkraman, because the Buddha had himself seen all this a thousand times more than the European public could be told or would believe. So consequently, by about the beginning of the Victorian period, the colonial masters of India, through their textual studies, had begun to see Buddhism and Hinduism as two irreconcilably, as I said, different religions, whereby Buddhism began to be portrayed as a protest or reform movement against Brahmanical Hinduism, which was utterly corrupt and degenerate. The Victorian Indologists, like many of their Prachan followers in today's India, only saw the Indian religious milieu from Judo Christian perspective and failed to see that Hinduism and Buddhism share holy space to the extent that persecution of one by the other was unheard of. One can cite no more than individual cases of crime, Indian society, or for that matter, Indian state is not known to have sponsored any kind of religious persecution, as I said. Left and right both agree on this issue in India even now. In this perception of the Buddha, that he had been an opponent of Hinduism, his status was enhanced enormously because by doing so, the Victorian Indological Scholarship put the Buddha in alignment with the majority of Victorians. In other words, within a British colonial context, it was mainly as a counter to the predominant Hindu system in India that the Buddha could be of use. The Buddha that was manufactured like this was an opponent of caste and the priestly system which supported this. Thus, he is turned into an advocate of social reform and some sort of Martin Luther of India. Now, so by do, doing this, 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 this kind of study of Indian uh, classics and portrayal, portrayal of uh, the Buddha as a sort of Martin Luther, a reformer, uh, a, a great uh, sort of equalizer, egalitarian philosophy, uh, op uh, opposition to caste system, opposition to Brahmins. So the Buddha is sort of portrayed like that. Even today, large number of uh, scholars uh, in India continue to sort of advocate that kind of perception of it. Whereas we know, for example, uh, the uh, Buddha never opposed caste system. The Buddha only said that uh, caste must be determined by a person's deeds, that is karma instead of birth, that is karma. He didn't say uh, the caste system um, shouldn't be there. The, 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 the Buddha never made a statement like, uh, like that. Also, the Buddha never opposed Brahmins as such. He only 
coerced or spoke against uh, uh, pretentious Brahmins. Otherwise, you do not hear any kind of criticism of Brahmins uh, in, in Buddhist texts. In fact, you have, uh, uh, say, in Dhamma, you have Brahman work. Brahmins are praised in all sorts of ways. The Buddha he, uh, calls himself a Brahman, so on and so forth. However, the Victorian Indologists now have a sort of agenda whereby the Buddha is shown as, uh, uh, as, as a sort of reformer or a revolutionary uh, who uh, is uh, uh, very similar to Jesus Christ. And he speaks for the poor man, he speaks for the downtrodden person. And as compared to this, Hinduism is very, very bad, it is very corrupt. Everything that uh, is bad, uh, it, it belongs to Buddhism and everything good that uh, is there belongs to, uh, sorry, everything bad that is there belongs to Hinduism and everything bad that is there belongs to Buddhism. So uh, uh, now we have uh, scholars like, uh, for example, Alexander Cunningham, who uh, was a soldier and uh, later became the founder of the Archaeological Survey of India. He, uh, scholars like him, also use material remains and all kinds of evidence that they could find to kind of follow this kind of thesis. For example, Alexander Cunningham himself, very interestingly, uh, only studied those sites which are mentioned by Sasha and Schwenzan in their travel works. He doesn't go beyond that. So all the work and all the digging and all the reports that were done by Alexander Cunningham uh, were only on the Buddhist sites. Hindu sites were completely left out. And uh, so Cunningham also openly and freely mocked Hindus who had perverted the very purity of Indian sculpture. So uh, people like Alexander Cunningham were saying that uh, if you look at uh, Buddhist art is as good and as pure as Hellenistic art, and uh, it is the Hindus who have perverted this art, so on and so forth. And uh, so Victorian Indologists also time and again find the treatment of images of Buddha uh, by the Hindus as very offensive. So they see Hindu priesthood as very powerful and very arrogant. And uh, uh, so these people, uh, for example, Cunningham says, uh, were the ones whom Buddha resisted because they were forcibly abducting their wives and children or daughters. And uh, so the Buddhist past was basically styled by these Victorian Orientalists as the authentic and unadulterated antithesis to the most abominable and degrading system of oppression ever invented by the craft of designing men, Hindus. And also all kinds of other interesting uh, but false things were invented by uh, these people. The most mischievous person appears to be Edwin Arnold, the author of uh, that uh, famous poem called The Light of Asia. He uh, was the, uh, the person who was basically behind inciting trouble at uh, the Mahabodhi temple. For example, uh, in one of his papers uh, that was published in the Daily Telegraph, he says that uh, the uh, uh, Maratha peasants were performing shrad at, at uh, uh, Mahabodhi temple and Mahabodhi tree. And they were totally ignorant and insensitive. They were using all kinds of uh, ladders and stairs to avoid the offensive sight of the Buddha. Buddha's image there. And uh, so all kinds of propaganda by people like Alexander Cunningham, Montgomery Martin, Hamilton Richardson uh, was kind of put into force. And uh, so they are sort of creating an image of Hinduism whereby the Hindus simply cannot stand the hateful image of the Buddha. And uh, also, it was Edwin Arnold for the first time who came up with this idea that Mahabodhi temple is in the control of Hindus, not Buddhists, and it deserves and it belongs to the Buddhists, and therefore 
but it should be handed over to the players. And uh, he, in fact, in one of his papers, wrote that uh, the price of this temple would be about one lakh rupees, and uh, funds should be collected, and this temple should be bought from the Hindus, because otherwise, the man will not hand over the temple to the Buddhists. When people like Cunningham and uh, Edwin Arnold were indulging in this kind of uh, propaganda, uh, the Burmese made a request for the repair of the temple. The Mahant was approached to the Raj, and uh, the Mahant was very happy. He said, absolutely no problem. You can repair it or do whatever you want. And uh, so the Burmese came around 1876, and they started repairing the temple. And now when they were repairing the temples, the temple, Alexander Cunningham made a complaint that the Burmese, Burmese workers were making a mess of the older temple. They were actually destroying it, and so therefore they should be stopped forthwith. So the complaint of these people, the British government stepped in and now took over the charge of the repair of the temple, so became a kind of stakeholder in the Mahabodhi temple's management. And consequently, in 1883, Alexander Cunningham, J.D. Beglar, along with Rajendra Lal Mitra, excavated this site and then rebuilt this temple. And uh, the cost of rebuilding the temple or repairing the temple came to about 100,000 rupees. The whole of his money was contributed by the Mahat. But when this was being done, at the same time, this uh, whole the propaganda, the efforts to drive a wedge between the Hindus and the Buddhists were going on. And uh, so Begler and Cunningham, on the one hand, were uh, indulging in this kind of propaganda. And on the other hand, the kind of temple that they built was totally different from the temple that was supposed to be repaired. So they were criticized very severely by various scholars. For example, the French scholars who were working in the Southeast Asia, especially Cambodia, they said that the kind of uh, vandalism in which Cunningham and his friends have indulged at Bodh Gaya, they shall not allow that kind of vandalism in Cambodia. For example, look at these two pictures. The one on the right is the original temple, and the one on the left is the temple that exists now that was basically. Uh, built by Alexander Cunningham and friends. Now, in the new temple, you have these four towers here and this front porch. All these things were kind of added, and uh, generally, it is believed the whole temple actually was demolished by Alexander Cunningham and his friends. And the new temple that was built was completely different from the old temple. The kind of excuse that uh, Alexander Cunningham and his friends used. The temple is being demolished by the uh, Burmese. Actually, it seems that they were the ones who actually demolished the temple, but this excuse of the Burmese was used uh, to bring in the uh, British government. And uh, so, thereby, the uh, Raj steps in and now becomes a stakeholder. And now, people like Kalingar have their kind of own say in the affairs of the temple. And around this time now, enters Angarit Dharampal. Now, Dharampal is known in Sri Lanka for uh, having given rise to the kind of extreme nationalism that exists in Sri Lanka today, the Sindhis nationalism. He is generally kind of held responsible by people. Of course, uh, Angarit Dharampal also played a very important role in sort of uh, uh, spreading Buddhism in uh, almost all the countries of the world. Uh, but as far as his role in um, the Mahabodhi temple is concerned, he uh, sort of, in a very strange manner, he picked up all the garbage that was written by Edwin Arnold in various uh, uh, papers, in the news, uh, various uh, articles in newspapers and writings of Alexander Cunningham and others. And by reading uh, uh, all this, now Anagarik Dharampal <coughs> starts a kind of campaign 
for the repossession of the Mahabodhi temple. Not till now, nobody had even heard of the Buddhists and Hindus kind of being two separate communities and uh, that this temple particularly belonging to the Buddhists only because Hindus had been worshipping here even from the period, from the pre-Buddhist period and the last day of the Shad ceremony was still being performed by the Hindus and the Mahabodhi tree and there was absolutely no problem. The Tibetans had no problem, the Burmese and the Thai people didn't have any problem, even the Sri Lankans didn't have any problem. It was only Angarik Dharmpal who was instigated by people like uh, uh, Edwin Arnold and Alexander Kingdom that he came up with this kind of demand that this temple actually belongs to the Buddhists and so should be handed over to Buddhists, particularly the Sri Lankans. And for that purpose, he laid the foundations of the Mahabodhi society and also started the Mahabodhi journey. And so speaking the same kind of language as was being spoken by the Victorian Indologists, Anandarik Dhampal has been writing and saying things like uh, the uh, Hindus have defaced the shrine with emblems and rituals foreign to its nature, that is nature to uh, the nature of Buddhism and Buddha. And uh, It has been suggested that uh, Anandarik Dhampal completely failed to comprehend the diplomatic minefield of colonization. And uh, he is only kind of repeating this demand that uh, the Shaiva occupants are wrong occupants of the temple and India oh, as a whole actually belongs to the Buddha, not to the Hindus, and this temple certainly belongs to the Buddhists only, and so therefore it must be handed over to them. And, uh, and he is using all kinds of very foul vocabulary against the Hindus in his writings. And for example, he uh, 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 Says about Hinduism that Hinduism was responsible for the vulgar practices of killing animals, stealing, prostitution, licentiousness, lying, and drunkenness. These are kind of you know universal kind of habits of the Hindus and so on and so forth. And Dharampal also has no hesitation in giving credit to Edwin Arnold that it is his idea that. Uh, uh, he has borrowed and uh, then he would like to restore the Buddhist Jerusalem to the Buddhist hands. So he says that this is the idea given to him by a God and he would like to basically do that no matter what. So he is also now criticizing taking a hint from these Victorian Indologists that uh, from his perspective, the worship rituals such as painting and clothing of the images performed by the Brahminical priests at the temple amounted to desecration. So for example, the way the Buddha's body is covered with the, 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 uh, the robe, the dress, he says is Hindu style and not Buddhist style and various kinds of tilaks and uh, the other stuff that these Hindus do is not Buddhist and the Hindus have turned the Buddha into a god and Buddha is not a god and Buddha is never worshipped. We don't do a worship the Buddha, we don't worship the statues, we don't, we don't put clothes like this on the Buddha. It is the Hindus who have been doing this and so therefore they are desecrating the image itself. And uh, so he completely ignores the fact that uh, Hindus and Buddhists had absolutely no conflict here. And they were sharing the holy space in a manner that nobody could ever even think of any conflict between the Hindus and the Buddhists. And when all this was going on and uh, uh, Angarik Dharmapal was making a lot of noise about uh, this uh, 
temple being desecrated by the Mahant and its people and the Hindus, and they were indulging in all kinds of ugly, bad practices here, which were completely uh, an insult of the Buddha and Buddhism. And uh, so uh, these practices are completely unbuddhistic. And uh, so when this was going on, the Raj constituted a commission called Bodhi Law Commission to look into this matter, whether the, the worshippers who are apparently Hindus, apart from Buddhists, of course, who were also worshipping there, are the Hindus indulging in practices which are kind of desecration of uh, uh, Buddhism or the statues of the Buddha or the temple. Now, Bordillo Commission submitted its report and it said that uh, actually different Mahayana Buddhists visiting the shrine were discovered to have been pro Hindu. And also, practices of most of the Mahayanas were exactly as that of the Hindus. So, the Bordillo Commission submitted that. Uh, some sects of Buddhists do make offerings of the material nature like the Hindus and the Mahayana worshippers are more or less saying as the Hindu worshippers and so therefore the kind of propaganda in which Anagarit Dharampal is indulging is, is, is not correct. And also the high royalty approached it's 12 Anagarit Dharampal and requested him not to really indulge in this kind of propaganda. For example, Prince Damrong, who had actually visited the Mahabodhi temple uh, some years ago, and he was very happy, the kind of reception he um, got uh, in the Mahabodhi temple by the Mahant. And he said, uh, he wrote a letter to Angarik Dharampal, and he said, why don't you pay attention to, you know, Buddhism and the kind of good work that a Buddhist should do, and uh, the diffusion of knowledge, uh, instead of uh, you know indulging in this kind of politics, many Sri Lankans were also happy with the kind of politics that uh, uh, Anagarik Dhampal was indulging. However, when uh, after having collected sufficient money, Anagarik Dhampal failed to purchase the temple from the Mahant. Mahant refused to do uh, to sell the temple. In fact, he snubbed him very badly. So now Anagarik Dhampal used another. That was he brought a, a statue from Japan of Amita Buddha, and uh, he installed this temple, uh, this statue, in the premises of the temple. Actually, in the central sanctorum of the temple, on the first floor. So you have two floors: the ground floor and the upper floor, on the upper floor. And uh, many statues before Angarik Dhampal had been installed by the Buddhists there. And there was absolutely no problem, but the kind of politics in which Dhampal was indulging and the kind of propaganda he was uh, uh, carrying out against the Mahant and Hindus. So now the people of the Mahant came and uh, stopped Angarik Dhampal from installing the statue. Actually, he had installed the statue, they picked it up and put it in the ground outside the temple. And many Sri Lankans approached Dhampal and told him not to please indulge in this kind of thing. It is not good for Buddhism, good for him. But he refused to listen to anybody. And uh, so Dhampal now lodged a complaint against the Mahant and his men that he was beaten up, so on and so forth. And uh, that the temple rightfully belongs to the Buddhists. Now this case went all the way to the Calcutta High Court. In the Calcutta High Court, Anagarik Dhampa lost the case. And uh, the Calcutta High Court judgment was quite critical of Anagarik Dhampa. And uh, the court said that there is absolutely no instance of any disturbance between the Buddhist worshippers and the Hindu monk or their subordinates. It is a multivalent, multi religious site. Hindus and Buddhists have been worshipping here without any problem. And so, therefore, what Anagarik Dhampa had done was wrong. And uh, so this was kind of a big sort of loss for Anagarik Dhampal. And also financially, it was a very, very big loss for Anagarik Dhampal. Now, Anagarik Dhampal had collected all kinds of funds for various kinds of activities, including establishing a Buddhist college and some other institutions. All that money that was gathered was largely spent by Anagarik Dhampal without permission uh, from the other uh, managers of these funds uh, on the court case. So about 22,500 
hundred rupees was spent on the on the case, which uh, by today's uh, prices would be more than one crore rupees. A lot of money. The and the entire temple uh, cost only hundred thousand rupees. The construction of the whole temple, and it was about one fifth of that money that was uh, spent by Anagar Dhampal on the case. And so after Anagarik Dhampal lost uh, the case in the High Court, now he started approaching various kinds of other fora. For example, the uh, Congress party, Gandhi ji was brought in, Babu Rajendra Prashad was brought in, and uh, they tried to help or they could not help. And then he approached uh, Hindu Mahasabha, Hindu Mahasabha, actually, because Hindu Mahasabha considered Buddhist Jains, Hindus, uh, basically part of the Sanatan Dharam, they had no problem if uh, uh, the Mahabudhi temple is handed over to Anagaragi Dhampal or whoever. And so they also tried to help. But ultimately, the kind of propaganda and the kind of vocabulary that Anagaragi Dhampal was using became kind of so irritating for everybody that finally even Hindu Mahasabha withdrew. So the Congress party and uh, different leaders uh, also uh, failed to uh, help Anagarik Dhampal. Ultimately, Anagarik Dhampal, he, he died in 1931. So he uh, uh, was not able to uh, kind of take possession of the Mahabodhi temple. Uh, so about the role of Mahabodhi, uh, Anagarik Dhampal in the Mahabodhi temple affair and also the Victorian colleges is that uh, Anagarik Dhampal was himself tangled in this knot in ways more complex than he could possibly have been aware. Although on the surface it may seem that he was simply trying to restore the image of the Buddha to its rightful place in the Mahabodhi temple. He was himself responding to and at the same time perpetuating a long-standing orientalist conception of Hindu-Buddhist relations. Thereby these two religions can never come together. And so this kind of difference between the two religions that was perpetuated and created by the Victorian Indologists was kind of sported to the hilt by uh, most of the time uh, uh, unconsciously by Anagarik uh, Dhampal and he created such a mess uh, around the Mahabodhi temple that this continued all the way up to India till India freedom. Uh, and when the, uh, the Bihar government then uh, uh, brought that the Mahabodhi Temple Management Act. But the problem being continued after that, then the UPA government, uh, um, 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 Professor Manmohan Singh actually made an application to the UNESCO for uh, heritage status for this temple, where in the application this uh, complex is shown as only a Buddhist place worship, not Hindu. Hindus have been worshipping there. And so the UPA government kind of got that heritage status. And then uh, Mr. Nitish Kumar, uh, in his previous uh, uh, government, also amended the Mahamudi Temple uh, Act, whereby uh, the magistrate uh, who had to be a Hindu, uh, it was changed to that he could be anybody. So now the management committee actually could be headed by a Muslim or a Jew or a Sikh or whoever, whoever happens to be the minister. So that is the story. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Sarao. Uh, you have brought uh, into this conference a very, very important perspective. And I'm sorry, I said, please say a few words about yourself. That's only because some people in the chats were asking me. Uh, uh, and I think Pankaji also has uh, uh, sent the link for the bios of all the participants. So please, those uh, who are not familiar with the work of some of our speakers, kindly look at that. But I just wanted to tell our uh, viewers and audiences that uh, Professor Sarao has written a really, really important, path-breaking book uh, on uh, not just the history of the Mahabodhi Temple. I think that was published by Springer. I remember looking at it. But for me, the eye-opening book that he wrote is called The Decline of Buddhism in India, a Fresh Perspective. I believe Motilal Banarsi Das published this book. But uh, <laughs> Oh, sorry, sorry. I, I beg your pardon. <laughs> Ram, uh, Lal. But for me, this, this book was the eye-opener, sir. When I read this, so many questions that had uh, troubled me for decades, 
uh, you know, you have suggested answers with evidence and the propaganda surrounding Hindu-Buddhist relations suddenly became clear in my mind because of you. And today, once again, you have done yeoman service in uh, showing us the Victorian conspiracy of divide and rule, which then we ourselves internalize. This is the power of Orientalism that uh, we internalize these ideas. And I, I saw this firsthand in terms of my research in, uh, uh, you know, Swami Vivekananda, where at the Parliament of Religions, he says, we are one. And uh, and, uh, and then he comes, he starts clashing with Angarika Dharampal, because Dharampal is, is uh, a completely contrary ideology. In the complete work of Vivekananda, you see this exchange and how, in a way, Vivekananda exposes him a kind of, uh, uh, you might call him opportunist, charlatan, whatever words you can use. But in your book by Springer on Mahabodhi Temple, all of this is very, very well documented. And even today, if you go to the Mahabodhi Temple, there is a Mahant who sits there. There is a Shivalinga. You can offer worship if you're a Hindu, as I did myself. But the, the Buddhistization of this shrine is, is as, as you said, uh, has been contributed to by a successive governments. So, uh, and the divisive narrative we had, this Dravidianism was also a conspiracy of these Victorian Indologists, you know, Bishop Caldwell and others. We All of this is now well known. But the important thing you've brought out is that the repercussions of this uh, divisiveness are still current, not only in Dravidian movements, which are in power today, but in all kinds of uh, distortions. And for me, before I read your book, I happened to visit uh, Ajanta and Arola. And when I saw three uh, beautifully, uh, you know, coexistent traditions in sculpture, I mean, there was no doubt in my mind. There's the great Kailash temple. There are great shrines to Buddha and Jaina shrines, all cheek by Joel. I said, if these people were constantly fighting for a thousand years, as we've been taught, this would have been practically impossible. But thank you so much. And I just wanted to add one footnote. Then I can request Pankaj Ji to say a few words and then throw it open. And I request those who have questions, please send them in the chat box. And I will also invite you to speak. There's no prohibition, but sometimes the voice doesn't come through. So I request you please send the questions in the chat box. Uh, I really request you to do that uh, so that it becomes easier for us to manage. There's a large number of participants. So uh, the thing that I wanted to say uh, 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 with due respect to Professor Thurman is once again, I see that kind of attitude there that please acknowledge what uh, Mahayan Buddhism or Sanskrit Buddhism has given Hinduism. So Tantra came from there, Yoga came from there, uh, even the uh, idea of Moksha came from there, and so on. But I think the way we view it, I myself have called it intermedial hermeneutics. See, nobody has an exclusive right, or you know, you can't patent that, oh, Tantra came from here, female goddesses came from here. I don't think this is a useful attitude. I think things came together out of dialogue. I think Professor Parua pointed this out beautifully. And even the Buddha didn't see himself as a Buddhist. And you rightly said this anti-Brahmanism was superimposed later. Most of the great uh, followers of Buddha were Brahmins. <laughs> and this tremendous prejudice that was built into this uh, uh, Hindu versus Buddhist uh, type of uh, clash uh, in fact, from your presentation, I mean, I didn't know the role Edwin Arnold had played. Thank you. Because even Gandhi read uh, read the Gita through Edwin Arnold. So Edwin Arnold needs to be looked at more closely. Uh, and uh, so do the theosophists, by the way. But uh, the, the last thing I wanted to say, the last thing I wanted to say, uh, I mean, and to finish the point of uh, Professor Thurman, I think that we are very grateful to His Holiness. We are very grateful for the uh, text that we've got back uh, through back translation, as it were. And obviously, this uh, retrieval of textual traditions of India is very, very important. But it's not just the Buddhist traditions. I mean, look at 
I mean, 3.5 million Sanskrit manuscripts, we haven't even begun to touch the surface. So this restoration and rebuilding of our lost heritage is a huge project, huge, huge project. And there's no need to say, oh, we are grateful to you, you're grateful to us. I think we are all one. And it's in dialogue that the great ideas, the defining ideas of, of uh, our tradition, our culture have come through dialogue. Similarly, Jain Hindu, some people are trying to make it into an oppositional tradition. I don't see it like that at all, frankly. And uh, uh, the last thing I wanted to say, which is a bit controversial, and if it offends somebody, I apologize in advance. But I would even hazard to say that many of uh, Dr. Ambedkar's ideas and his riddles of Hinduism and so forth, where he takes a very uncompromising position, uh, where he says Hindu society is unequal, it's Brahminical and so forth. I think these ideas come from these same Victorian Orientalists. In fact, those were the people he read at Columbia and elsewhere. Uh, and his attempt to uh, even purify Buddhism. He doesn't like a lot of contemporary Buddhism if you read Buddha and his Dhamma. But I think uh, uh, Dr. Ambedkar had uh, internalized these ideas and his notions of Hinduism were clouded by these same Victorian uh, Orientalists who wanted to drive a wedge between uh, between the Sanatani and the co-Sanatani, as I call it. To me, they're all Sanatani, but some people don't like it. So I said, okay, Sanatani and co-Sanatani. And these had no real uh, division, difference, except a short time when the Shaivites and the Jainas in Tamil Nadu, there were some clashes. But by and large, I think the, there was peaceful coexistence. There were no witch hunts on the basis of religion. And this taking over of each other's shrines, breaking temples, destroying temples, all of this came later. So, Professor Sarao, I thank you for your brilliant exposition. I would recommend your books. Two books I've already recommended. Everybody should read these books. Mahabodhi, uh, the history of Mahabodhi is a masterly exegesis. Please read it. Uh, Springer has published it. It's available. The early, earlier book by Munshilal Manoharala. Uh, Manor Ram is also a very, very important book. Nobody has been able to explain why Buddhism declined. Your book shows that what exactly happened. And uh, finally, about uh, Himalayan Buddhism, Sanskrit Buddhism, the Vajrayan traditions are so powerful. It's not just the dialectical traditions of Nalanda, but the but the Yogachar traditions, the Vajrayan traditions. Padma Sambhava as a great unifier in this region. And the kinds of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, practices that are still there in Ladakh, which predate, which predate uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhism. I think these are things to talk about, though some of them may be controversial. Pankaji, please make some comments and then uh, let us uh, go over to the questions. There are quite a few I've got already. I, I'll just take. Uh, I'll just say that uh, I discovered Professor Sarah through his Encyclopedia of Buddhism and Jainism that came through Springer. Uh, thank you again, sir. Uh, I think Makranji has really summarized very well what you all uh, shared with us. I'll just say about Professor Thurman also. He was my professor when I was doing my master's in religious studies at Columbia University, and uh, I used to have similar dialectical debates and even polemics uh, against each other. Professor Thurman would. Uh, mock Hinduism, I would mock Buddhism, and that's how we had a lot of fun at Columbia before I met, uh, just after I met Bakranji in back in 2002 in New York. So those were the days all the memories were revived. With that, I will take my leave. Now I'll go back to sleep. It is 1.47 a.m. here in Dallas, but I welcome all the participants and their comments, and I'm sure you'll all have great fun. I'll join back probably for the uh, afternoon session later. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Pankaji. Sleep well, have a peaceful rest. And uh, I once again thank you for this uh, uh, wonderful uh, conference. I'm enjoying every moment of it. Sleep well, we'll see you soon. Now, let me read a few comments that have already come from uh, Dr. Arvind Kumar Singh. Very eye opening. He says the Angarika Dharmapala uh, controversy, Mahabuddhi temple dealt with totally different perspective from traditional views. Well-documented, very enlightening speech, very informative. 
Uh, then I've got a few more comments in the chat box. Eye-opening, eye beautifully presented, uh, praising Professor Sarao. Uh, and again, from me, Kalyana Sundaram. Thank you, Professor Rao. He says, Balram Shuklaji says, our own fellow. He's a great uh, scholar. He's one of the few people, uh, Professor Shukla, who's a, uh, who's a great uh, scholar in both Sanskrit and Persian. And he's working on Prakrit uh, right now. And uh, Vayakirana Kakara of a great uh, repute. Anyhow, he says so-called reformers generally bifurcate past into two chunks, recent and remote. Contempt against Hinduism showcases the same tendency, whether it be Cunningham or Muhammad Iqbal. Deepak Kumar, thank you. Professor Sarah, also very informative, and so on. Now, uh, OK, since I've got no question, please raise your hand. And I can't see all of you. So kindly raise your hand. And when I call you, unmute yourself and please ask the question. Go ahead. I think I'll invite Professor Bhatt first, since I see him. And he's a very eminent scholar. Bhatt Saab, kindly, kindly share your enlightening thoughts, please. You. Please unmute yourself, sir. I'm muting myself. Please, you unmute yourself. Ah, I'm sure. Take me, sir. Hello. I'm audible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, we had uh, a very well researched and uh, well documented uh, presentation by Professor Sarah. I congratulate him for uh, his uh, erudition. In fact, uh, Indian culture has been holistic and integral. And uh, only some vested interest uh, tried to have uh, this sort of uh, division uh, between uh, Hinduism and Buddhism or Hinduism and uh, Jainism. Uh, about Jainism also, uh, we have Sagarmal Jain, uh, led Professor Sagarmal Jain, where he clearly writes that uh, uh, Jainism has been a part of Hinduism. And uh, when uh, Lord Mahavir uh, observed 21 days of fast, uh, he said that he will speak only to Vedic Brahmins. This is on record. And uh, we have uh, another ancient text in Jainism, uh, Rishi Bhashitam, where Vedic Rishis are also mentioned there, and uh, some Charvak Rishis are also mentioned. Uh, so even this sort of division between uh, the uh, Vedic uh, and the uh, Shamanic uh, or uh, uh, this uh, Lokayat uh, is a, a later imposition. It's not there uh, in uh, original. So if you go to the original text, uh, we find that uh, there is a perfect homogeneity and there has been uh, Vada, not Vivada, Vada in the form of Samvada. And we have uh, many treatises uh, on Vada Vidhi, how Vada should be conducted in the form of Samvada, should not degenerate into uh, Vivada. So uh, I think it's high time that uh, we uh, look back uh, to our uh, classical art uh, or knowledge traditions and uh, restore uh, their uh, purity and uh, uh, make them free from uh, distortion. Uh, Professor Sarav uh, is a very good uh, Buddhist historian and therefore, uh, uh, like Sagarmal Jain, he also has contributed quite a lot uh, for Buddhist studies. Uh, and uh, uh, I therefore uh, uh, very much uh, um, feel uh, happy in, in listening to him. 
I myself wrote a, a book on Buddhist epistemology, uh, published from uh, Greenwood Press. And it, I have pointed out there also that uh, uh, how uh, Buddha has uh, accepted all noble ideas in the existing Vedic tradition. Only some distortions and deviations he had uh, uh, pointed out and criticized. Buddha was never anti-Vedic. Nowhere in the Pali literature we find uh, anything uh, written, uh, spoken by Buddha against the Vedic uh, uh, sublime tradition. And uh, as uh, Professor Saraf has already pointed out, uh, in the uh, Dhammapada, the last chapter is Brahman Vagga. Wherein, uh, uh, say, what are the characteristics of a Brahmana? and how a Brahman has to be approached is very well discussed. Uh, only through karma we have uh, this sort of uh, division in the society, not through birth. Uh, this is what Buddha said. And in fact, uh, some Buddha sometimes also expressed that in the next birth, uh, he would like to be a Brahmin. Well, uh, these are all uh, well documented things not uh, uh, later concoctions. And therefore, uh, we have to go back to the originals and uh, keep the record straight. Uh, and for that, uh, I congratulate the Professor Ravans again. And uh, I also congratulate uh, uh, Professor Makran Pranjay for his positive attitude. Because uh, uh, many people have this sort of negative and divisive approach. Uh, and But uh, uh, Makran has uh, a very constructive and positive approach. And therefore, I come with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Those are words of blessing for us. I'm deeply grateful. And now we have a question. Uh, let me read you the question from Professor uh, Tripathi. He says, uh, uh, he says, uh, one minute. I'm just trying to catch his question because many questions are coming in. He says, since you have done an extensive study, may I ask, were there no scholarly writings against these Victorian indologists then? I mean, were they not contested? If not, why so? Any specific reason that there were not scholarly rejection of those writings? This is from Dr. Tripathi. Uh, Professor Rao, please answer. Professor Rao, yeah, please answer. Now, uh, of course, there have been uh, some, scho some scholars who have written uh, small research papers and things here and there. Professor Bhatt is one of them, uh, Professor G.C. Pandey, then Professor Lalmani Joshi. They have from time to time written a few things. But the problem has been, seriously, because I am a person of history. I did my B honors and MA in history from Delhi University. Trust me, uh, till the, uh, the the KP government came uh, to power in Delhi, ICHR, Indian Council of Historical Research, Delhi University, JNU, Jamia Millia, Aligarh University, which normally contribute historians to the country. They were all controlled by our leftist friends. Congress are uh, Congress is basically Prachan leftists. I mean, uh, many of them have been my teachers, but the problem is, unless you, you are a leftist, you wouldn't get a job in a university, in, even in a college. Uh, the situation has been even today so very bad. So you couldn't really grow as a scholar unless you were a leftist or at least pretend to be a leftist. Even after the BJP government came to power. Look what is happening at the ICHR. I'm sorry to say this. ICHR still is in the control of people who have absolutely no knowledge of history. BJP government and RSS people have been putting people into the Indian Council of History Research who have absolutely no knowledge of history. If there are a few scholars who are historians, for, for example, my Guruji Dilip Chakra, to have uh, one European scholar who is an Indian citizen now called Elst, and then another uh, French uh, scholar who is also an Indian, Danino. Michel Danino. Have been kicked out of ICHR completely. So, therefore, in India, even till now, there is absolutely no opportunity to have access to any resources to do any work. You will actually you would lose your job if you do that kind of work. I know the kind of problems I face. Uh, when I take on, say, ICHR for uh, kind of making, you know, grants to people who have absolutely no knowledge of history, 
after the bjp government came to power and before that uh, the, the the congress government totally and particularly left the people like rifan habib and professor rs sharma my guru ji again completely controlled icc so with that kind of situation uh, thank you thank you yeah. professor yeah. sarav yeah. i think those of yeah. us who have been in academics have first hand uh, experiences i was at jnu and uh, i call, i used to call it the puncher puncher bakar ya the bikar so first you are branded then you are boycotted then you are browbeaten then you are bullied and the last word is a bit unparliamentary if they can't silence you then they bullshit you in other words people just keep throwing nonsense at you and you get entangled and all your time wasted in useless uh, discussions anyhow but we'll steer away from the politics of academics we'll come back to the uh, important issue here's a question from dr sonia uh, jasrotia she says uh, sir was dr ambedkar influenced by the victorian historians or was he sailing on the wave against the sanatan dharma uh, professor sara would you like to say anything about this i think dr ambedkar was uh, a very patriotic person uh, if you read his book uh, thoughts on pakistan you would realize of course there was all kinds of uh, struggle going on for share in the resources access to the resources and gandhi he was playing his own uh, kind of politics so ambedkar perhaps as a matter of survival perhaps used this tool exactly as the victorian indologists had, had done so in in certain ways he also became a sort of tool in the hands of his victorian colleagues or the kind of thinking of the victorian indologists and that kind of thing has continued even till today Uh, i wouldn't like to name any particular community but there are uh, certain um, groups of people who call themselves as uh, so called good people and uh, they think they have a kind of ownership of buddhism and uh, you say anything in you see in ac- academic criticism academic criticism you disagree with me i have no problem but uh, you begin threatening me with physical violence i have faced a couple of times in maharashtra nagpur and pune where uh, followers of uh, dr ambedkar uh, completely throw academic debate to the winds many of them they just become very physical and very violent so that kind of thing has continued and let me give you an example of delhi university itself i retired about a year and a half ago till today my pension file has not been processed by delhi university because delhi university is in complete control of left and congress the two groups don't like me at all so my file is missing and uh, i'm on the verge of starvation i have to borrow money from my brother and others and uh, i don't have even have money for to pay rent because these uh, uh, colleagues of mine at delhi university just a sort of you know think theek uh, hai you know so that kind of environment with and i think uh, dr ambedkar also sort of became a sort of tool to some extent sir uh, i'm very sorry to hear this let's see if we can help in any way i think we should write to ministry about this it's a very serious matter and i'm sure bhat saab uh, can also help he's very well known very well connected uh, he can put in a word i think uh, i think stopping 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 your pension is not acceptable on any ground whatsoever certainly not on ideological ground now we have a few uh, questions for you actually we are running out of time but the questions i'll take two more one question is about the btmc act this comes from yeah. uh, dr arvind kumar singh he says why should uh, the chairman uh, belong to any community he says if he's a muslim uh, i mean uh, the question is throw some light on btmc act and uh, 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 if the chairman is the district magistrate of gaya but if he or she is a muslim then the chairmanship will be given to someone else is that true he is asking you uh the uh, the uh, act that was originally passed i think in 19 uh, 1949 according to that the magistrate must be a hindu if the magistrate happens to be a non hindu then the government nominates a hindu as the fifth member who would be the chairperson so for for hindus for buddhists and the chairperson has to be a hindu now sri nitish kumar in the previous government amended this act and according to the amendment now the magistrate could be a muslim and 
whoever he or she is shall be the chairperson of the manager. So now actually a Muslim group here. Okay. Yes. Anyway. Okay, thank you. Here's a I think this will be our last question from Professor Smrita Smita Srinivas. It's a kind of complicated question. She says, wonderful workshop, and thank you, Professor Sarao. Are the analytical, philosophical traditions of Vedanta, Nyaya, etc., separated from these cultural diatribes against Hinduism and Buddhism? In other words, there's a there is a separation that we could make between uh, you know the analytical traditions and the ideological or the polemical traditions this is her question uh, uh, cultural diet tribes against hinduism versus buddhism or did the scholarly traditions in india uh, chicago etc that <laughs> that followed uh, sorry i'll just finish it's a longish intervention i'll read it out uh, did or did the Victorians dilute our understanding of true Indic philosophical traditions as well? It seems that perhaps a close analysis of the logic systems, for example, may have wanted to separate mathematical versus practice traditions of philosophy uh, and Buddhist contributions are evident in such discussions on epistemology, but perhaps the practice traditions seem to have seemed arcane to Western analytical philosophers. So we have less attention to these traditions and more attention to the so-called rational mathematics and traditional practices. Are these false distinctions for scholars of Indic traditions? So just to sum up, it's a complex question. I haven't possibly fully understood it myself. She's asking, can we separate logic from polemics on the one hand? And can we separate mathematical logic? We have a fellow, uh, Professor uh, Raju, who is an expert on Ganit. I don't know whether he's joined us. But can you separate mathematical logic from other uh, analytical traditions in both Hinduism and Buddhism? Sir, go ahead, please. I don't know, so it's very difficult for me to sort of answer this. But I uh, sort of know is that uh, I think it's virtually impossible to sort of cut the uh, sort of Indic tradition into different uh, parts and pieces, as uh, Professor Baruo was also saying, Professor Pranjpe also said. I think it's not. It, it's, it's wrong to sort of cut them and see to see them as different from each other. And uh, so when I uh, look at uh, the six uh, different philosophical systems uh, in ancient India, then Jainism and Buddhism, people try to people those who try to see them as separate and in, in certain ways kind of um, um, confrontational. I think that kind of thing is wrong. That that kind of thing didn't exist. And also in India. Uh, uh, things were settled through debate. So you have two viewpoints, you have a debate. So Buddhists, Jains, Hindus, within Hinduism, various other kind of groups would have a debate and settle things on the basis of debate. I think there was a lot of a, um, conflict. It was basically a debate, the tradition of debate, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's very hard to uh, splice through these traditions, as you said. I think Professor Bhatt wants to say something. Go ahead, sir. Uh, Professor Bhatt, please unmute yourself and answer. I'm unmuted, I believe. Can ah, I sir, yes. yes, sir. Please go ahead. Sir, go ah. ahead. So, a clear distinction has been drawn between Vada, Chala, Vitanda, Nigrasan, etc. And uh, only Vad has been approved uh, as a mode of philosophizing. And we have a saying, Vade, Vade, Jayate. So, what alone is to be undertaken in a philosophical debate uh, that has been done 
uh, in our tradition uh, uh, within the Brahmanic traditions, within the Shamanic traditions, and in between Brahmanic and uh, Shamanic traditions. So uh, we have to, in fact, uh, visit uh, our classical heritage once again, afresh, with a positive mind. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think uh, 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 Professor Smita Srinivas has also said, I don't need a rushed answer. She says, I'm trained in mathematics and economist and see a false analytical philosophy emerging. I agree it's mixed, but there's a very useful strand for us to constructively advance in order to make an indic philosophical contribution. Thank you. Thank you so much. There's one more question. Uh, from uh, Mr. Saji Varghese. He says, uh, Professor Sarao, is there, a, is there a way we have an answer to Professor, uh, we have an answer to the extremism? I, I request everybody else to unmute. Please. So, so he, uh, Mr. Varghese is saying, is there a way to answer the extremism of Sri Lankan and Myanmar Buddhism, considering that they are our neighbors? Sir, please answer. I think uh, uh, Buddha uh, says in the Agaiya Sutta that initially the, the so called primitive communistic society, uh, everybody was happy, everybody had equal access to the resources. Whatever you needed, you could go and take from other nature. There was absolutely no problem. Suddenly, some wise guys, instead of going every time whenever they needed food to nature, started property comes into existence. And so, when this happened, people started stealing because when a poor person has no food, uh, no money, would steal. And so when people started stealing, to stop them, you have uh, a government punishment, a king. So uh, the Buddha says ultimately that uh, as long as uh, you have poverty, denial of access to resources, it's impossible to think in terms of this. So in our neighborhood also, perhaps it is basically uh, to uh, um, kind of control resources. I suppose communities organize themselves uh, on uh, such lines. Communal lines, I think, uh, is also open such a kind of way of organizing yourself. And in this uh, kind of uh, uh, nationalism that has uh, arisen in Sri Lanka, I think like a Bhampa used religion uh, to the extent that, uh, uh, so this kind of perception of that Buddhists uh, are uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, English and this means not to do this and so on and so on. There is uh, this type of for basically possession of resources in that small country that we have. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very fine answer. We've seen that in the in, in our history, especially in the recent history, when the census and vote banks and numbers became uh, uh, versions of uh, religious identity, caste identity, and linguistic identity, regional identity, all being deployed in this, uh, you know, divisive narrative. So, uh, anyhow, some of us have been up. I've been up since six. You know, this has been very exciting, and we were preparing. So we must break for lunch. But uh, I've got a request from my friend. Uh, uh, Professor Ananta Kumar Giri, I will give him the chance to conclude this session. He's a very wise man, uh, very well read. Uh, he's an activist, he's a poet, uh, and uh, he has his PhD from Johns Hopkins and has been uh, at the Madras Institute of Development Studies. Ananta Bhai, please be brief and conclude this session. And uh, I just wanted to say one thing that our afternoon session will begin at 2. We have a very interesting uh, afternoon today. Professor Vinod Virvans, who is an amazing uh, scholar on Indian music, he will speak. Professor Bharat Gup, my, my friend, for at least 35 years, he'll speak on the Natya Shastra, which was his PhD topic. And uh, 
He's a great expert on this. He's worked on it. He's written books on it. So we begin with that. And then uh, we have uh, Professor Nataraju uh, in the afternoon chairing. I mean, the first session will be chaired by Professor Rita Ganguly, senior uh, professor. I think she's a musician as well, if I'm not mistaken. But in the afternoon, uh, we have a presentation uh, from uh, uh, Professor uh, Bala Ganapati Devara Kunda of Delhi University. He was the head of Department of Philosophy. We all know him and his work, History of Indian Philosophy, Analysis of Contemporary Understanding of Classical through Coronial. And then another friend of ours will join from the USA, from the uh, from the Shawnee State University in Ohio, Professor Lavanya Vemsani, who has two PhDs, one from Hyderabad and one from the USA. So please uh, join us exactly at two o'clock. And now I invite my friend Ananta Bhai. Uh, please uh, say some wise words and conclude the session. Uh, thank you so much, uh, dear Makaran Bhai and uh, Professor Sharao and uh, Professor Robert. I was thinking both these two papers, they really invite us for further uh, you know, hard work of labor. And uh, this is uh, possibly not the time to raise some questions, but in the spirit of Makaran's invitation, beginning with his very broad uh, invitation in the morning. So this challenge of being with Indology and Indic studies today, and my only submission here, and even if, and I think terming it Bharata Vidya is deeply inviting, but this journey is also a journey with the contemporary. So therefore we are invited to be with temporal in a very open sense. So to cultivate Indology and Indic studies with both the contemporary and multiple layers of time. And it is in this sense, these two papers, Professor Robert's paper about Sanskrit Hinduism, for example. But this paper, Sanskrit Hinduism, is an invitation for understanding layers of the multilingual as it draws on the Pali and also the Tibetan sources and translation. And with Professor Sarao, for example, how do we realize the Buddha? Now, the Buddha might not have critiqued the caste system. But the very idea of caste on your own achievement itself, what are the criteria of achievement? They might not have critiqued the Brahminical system, but the idea of the Brahman in Buddha's sadhana, is it the same as the idea of the Brahman? I think these are further invitations for us. And my also another submission is that speaking about Buddhist studies, the kind of the cosmopolitan and the planetary conversation that took place between the Greek sources and the Buddhist sources and in Central Asia, the dialogue between Islam and Buddhist epistemology. And, and therefore, in cultivating Bharata Vidya as a, 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 as a contemporary, which builds on multiple layers of our reality and civilization, we also need to include Islamic sources. And uh, so that was my submission to this very deeply inviting uh, dialogue and exploration. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Ananta. I think Al-Baruni is a very important defining text in many ways. And uh, if we had a paper, a new reading of Al-Baruni, it would have been great. But I really uh, want to resonate to your idea of temporality, because all times are included in the present. Our notion of Kala is so complex. Times past, times present. And from an Aurobindonian uh, perspective, times future are also contained in the time present. And we want, uh, we want this present uh, to be a gift, to be a present, if I were to pun on the word present, uh, to the scholarly community. Uh, which has taken time to join us uh, from the US, from Europe, and from different parts of India. My pronouns to all of you. Please enjoy your lunch, and please be back at 2 o'clock. I want to see all of you back. I know you're very busy, but we're all working from home. 
So don't abandon us. Please join us again. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you.